considered a public community meeting. There is time for public participation during the meeting as indicated on the agenda. Mr. Carpenter? Present. Mr. Dorn? Here. Mr. Kinsey? Present. Mr. Price? Here. Mrs. Swalwin? Here. All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, our first, our first order of business is our good news recognition. And so, uh, Jenna Hill, please come on up and um, I will assist you. Good evening, my name is Jenna Hill. I am the assistant principal at the middle school, and I am very excited today to present uh, two awards that the middle school earned for the 2021 school year. Uh, the first is called the Harold C. Shaw School Award, uh, and out of 176 schools that participated in the 2021 State Science Day, we were one of 14 schools to be able to claim this award. Uh, the executive director for the Ohio Academy of Science said this about our teachers. As STEM educators, thank you for making inquiry-based research and engineering design a top priority and for allowing students to apply what they are being taught. Your students are a true inspiration. The second award that was earned by our science department uh, was the National Science League Award. Uh, we won second place, so second in the nation at the seventh and eighth grade level. Twelve students were members of our science team. Uh, so I want to say a special congratulations to our science teachers for promoting the scientific process uh, in our classes. And a special congrats to Jen St. Pierre, who is the science fair advisor. But all science teachers were part of this. We had seventh and eighth graders in this. Uh, so we have uh, some of our science teachers with us tonight. So uh, I would love to invite them up and thank them for serving our students and helping us earn these prestigious awards. We have Jen Kaye, Emily Klein, and Shelby Sigmund. And you saw Lindsay Allen when you came in. She is working the game. Uh, and Kayla Bregman is one of our volleyball coaches, so she's just across the gym. And then Crystal Current is our other one that can not attend. So. There's a link. Thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you so All right, uh, next section is correspondence, and I can vouch that personally I received a huge amount of correspondence from uh, the community uh, over the, since the last uh, meeting, which was only two weeks ago. The uh, vast majority of it uh, related to masking um, with uh, professional and polite, but very passionate perspectives, um, both for masking and for not masking, um, so that would say pretty, pretty evenly split um, between those perspectives. So any other board members want to comment on the communication that they received? No. All right. Okay, I'm sure we will hear from folks this evening in person. Um, I picked up the list and we have a Maybe a couple dozen folks who are signed up to speak. So let's go on to reports to the board. Um, Mr. O'Malley, would you like to speak regarding? There you are. 
speak regarding our Green County Career Center as our representative. Sure. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, today or this year, the Green County Career Center opened the 2020, or excuse me, 21-22 school year, which uh, on August 18th, and they've got 445 junior students coming in. So it's one of the biggest classes ever. Um, they also opened two new technology areas: uh, drones and the UAS technology, as well as robotics and automation. So there's a lot going on out there as far as technology goes. Um, uh, speaking, you know, piggybacking on what Jenna Hill said earlier. Um, some of the uh, engineering stuff, the Green County Career Center and the uh, Bell Road Schools, as you guys are aware of, uh, have expanded the partnership to add Project Lead the Way engineering classes at Bell Road Middle School. Uh, Kayla Bruggerman and Jennifer St. Pierre joined the staff and will be teaching those at the middle school. Um, these programs will be members of the Technology Students of America Career Technical Organization um, and it gives students the opportunity to participate in the regional as well as national levels in engineering. And uh, Beaver Creek schools have done this and competed well at the national level, so we expect Velvet to do the same thing. And as an engineer, I'm excited to see it. You know, sure. grow the engineers early, we need them all. Um, yeah. so, uh, another point, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, John Husted visited the Career Center and was able to try out some of the heavy equipment and welding simulators, and then visited with students from the Advanced Engineering Systems, welding and metal fabrication, construction technology, and electronic wiring and motor controls. Um, finally, the Career Center will be hosting a dedication ceremony to the new building. And for anybody that hasn't been out there, I encourage you to go out there and see the new building. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of great things going on. And then uh, they'll have a uh, dedication ceremony and open house in November with more details about. Okay. Okay. Right. Any questions? Lions Club Festival this weekend. Please show up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Going on to um, other board committee reports um, for the OSBA legislative liaison. The, um, not much happening in the in the summertime. Um, there, early on in the summer, Governor DeWine signed into to law House Bill 244 that prohibits public schools from mandating a vaccine that is not fully approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So now that we do have one, that um, option would be available uh, for public schools in Ohio. Uh, it would also prohibit public schools from discriminating, excuse me, discriminating against an individual who has not received a vaccine, including precautions that differ from the activities or the precautions of, of an individual who has received a vaccine. David, on that, I think uh, it takes effect. Uh, I believe not currently, right? Is it mid October when it comes into play? Um, it does not uh, specify here on that. That was passed and does not. Uh, yeah. Is it not nine months. days after October? Okay. So about mid October. So uh, we'll, I think probably touch on it later, but that throws an interesting um, consideration into our current flow chart and that's the differentiation between vac vaccinated and unvaccinated. Correct. Right. So it's going to further complicate. Uh, situation so just be aware of it that comes around in the October time frame when that, when that uh, law becomes effective. Um, also um, each week they identified that the Ohio Department of Education excuse me the Ohio Department of Health uh, released updated quarantine guidelines for K-12 students and adults who are exposed to an individual with COVID-19 in a classroom setting and they updated it practically every week um, over the summer. So this has been uh, quite a fluid uh, fluid thing here at the, at the state level. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Move this a little bit closer. Does that help? All right, thank you. I'm, I'm frequently accused of being soft-spoken anyway. Um, so the Ohio Department of Health essentially updated their quarantine uh, policies practically every week over the summer, Ohio Department of Health. Um, and then in the Ohio Department of Education, um, Paolo de Maria, who is our uh, state um, superintendent for uh, the Ohio Board of Education, is retiring in September. They appointed uh, John Richard uh, to be the interim superintendent, and then he subsequently uh, resigned from the State Board of Education. So 
uh, they are now on a lookout for another interim because Christian hasn't even gone yet. So it's kind of reminded me of the fact that we have two elected board members and three appointed board members here. So a little bit of a revolving door um, getting to a point where we've kind of stabilized as well. All right. Going on to the next one, uh, the SEF and financial advisory. Uh, Mrs. Doran, anything? So I, I do have some updates from the SEF. Um, we met last week. Uh, the SEF is sponsoring the Hall of Fame in, uh, induction. That will be August 8th. And they're going to change up a little bit. Um, usually, that induction happens in this room, and it's a sit down dinner and a big uh, event in the evenings. Um, but instead, they're going to, to target our high schoolers, so they will be um, conducted in front of our high school seniors as a way to show um, those students what what is ahead and what has happened to previous graduates and what they too can achieve. So um, that will be taking place on October 8th, and there will be seven new inductees. That would be, uh, Mike Kirkman saying that's last year's class and this year's class will all be inducted because last year's event did not happen due to COVID. And then also the Funtober Fall Fest will be happening Sunday, October 17th here at the middle school uh, from 3.30 to 6.30. So anyone with um, kids or looking for a good time um, mark that on your calendar, October 17th, that's a Sunday. Uh, regarding the Financial Advisory Committee, uh, no new updates. That committee chat does not meet over the summer, uh, and so they have not met since the last time I updated you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Price, anything from the Safety Committee? There will be a meeting, uh, Jeanette, correct me, it's in September, will be meeting uh, to address school safety concerns, of which uh, probably one of the strongest focuses at this point is safe passage to school. Um, one of the things that will, has been, I've, I've already communicated with the city manager, unfortunately over the summer we had a turnover with the Bellbrook city manager. But one of the things we talked about was the potential of adding crosswalks across 725 for the communities that are south of uh, 725 for kids that go to, uh, to uh, Stephen Bell. Uh, one of the concerns too is the uh, the efficiency or effectiveness, I guess is a better word, of our existing uh, crosswalks. Um, that remains a concern and it was pretty uh, disappointing for me to see us start school with the crosswalk in front of the middle school and probably the busiest road uh, not working. And so I communicated with the, uh, uh, the township about that and it was literally due to some backlog of parts. Uh, as you well know, this whole uh, room no doubt knows that we you can't even uh, man restaurants fully these days. So certainly, technical, uh, you know, te technical, you know, companies, things like that, are also behind. So there was a back order on the circuit board, and that's why that one's not working. Uh, one uh, very uh, good thing to report is we now have a crossing guard at the middle school in the mornings. So Jess, I believe, we also have one over at BCI as well on uh, the Belt Road. So that was a real concern. We, we uh, you know, kids making their way across the street, even with the lights flashing or not, uh, was not uh, something we felt comfortable with at all, at least certainly not me. Um, and so we looked for ways to address that. One of the ways was a school safety patrol. I think it's a little bit complicated, though, with kids guiding kids across roads. Um, so I'm really gr grateful that uh, we found a way. Uh, I can't take credit, uh, Janice and others here. Uh, but uh, found a way to uh, get uh, this uh, crossing guard available in the morning, uh, in the afternoons as well, I believe. So uh, that, that's really good news. We will meet with the school safety patrol of the trip way in September. Uh, it would provide some, uh, I guess, help, assistance in shepherding uh, little sheep uh, as they make their way out of the building, heading out to their car, their parents' cars to be picked up and things like that. It also provides a great opportunity for uh, leadership Opportunities. So in other words, uh, if you want to be on the school safety patrol, you better be, you know, behave and you better have good grades and things like that. And you get a badge and you get a belt and all that kind of stuff that kids get all excited about. So we're going to explore uh, next, we'll, we'll meet next month and then after that we'll, we'll do some more uh, discussion about whether uh, we should move forward on that. Uh, and so uh, more to come. But at least, you know, my dream was to have somebody watching somebody across the street. It looks like we've got some adults to do that but we can still realize the benefits from the school safety patrol. So I have more to talk about 
with respect to uh, you know, the lighting and the crosswalks and uh, school safety control, probably maybe in October. Uh, well, hopefully we see progress on the light out here. It's still broken yesterday when I drove by it. So I'll follow up with the township on that. But some of these other things I will uh, probably have to report on in October after we meet with uh, the local fire police and uh, representatives of the school district here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, Mrs. Softland, do we have anything from the Green County uh, Education Service Center, the business advisor? No, we sick Okay, thank you very much. All right, moving on then uh, to the superintendent's report. Dr. Kozad, can you give us that after school update, please? All right, um, wanted to do some updating on our back to school plan that is on our website. Um, it's been posted there for at least since the beginning of August and as Mr. Carpenter said, things continually change, they continue to get refined, clarified and so forth. So um, as a part of that clarification, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Mr. Bowles. So as the I think this is page two, yes, page two of our back to school plan. Um, we talk about the COVID-19 dashboard and we're going to at least update that twice weekly. At this point, it was just once weekly on Monday because information we report to the state is always Monday through Sunday. So um, we're gonna update that on Monday and we're gonna try to update that, not try, we're gonna update that probably on Thursday, so a Monday to Sunday, and then um, Monday to Wednesday, and then the next week, Thursday to Sunday. So three days worth of information and four days worth of information. So again, trying to provide uh, updated information of positive students that are positive, staff that are positive, and then also quarantines uh, based on school exposure. So we, we provide information on any positive student or staff, but we only report those uh, quarantine exposures or those exposures at school, not outside of school. We don't report those. The other part of the yellow here is a clarification on a close contact. Um, so if your child is identified as a close contact, you're going to receive notification from the school nurse in Green County Public Health. and while Green County Public Health is going to officially quarantine you, in the meantime, the school nurse will walk you through and or will guide you through the ODH guidelines for quarantine um, that were put out uh, by ODH. And so um, Green County Public Health is working on increasing their staffing on close contact callers. Right now, they're supposed to get back with people between 24 to 48 hours. We hope to dramatic, or they hope to dramatically shorten that amount of time before they get back with somebody by hiring additional staff. And so, Green County, not Green County Public Health, but Green County is going to be funding that. Um, and following that reference sheet, that flow chart, they meet the quarantine criteria they shouldn't attend school. Even though the official determination of quarantine comes from Green County Public Health, that student is excluded until that time. So again, if Green County Public Health doesn't contact you, there's the contact information on here. And again, a letter is sent out to those parents. A phone call is made, a letter sent out to those parents that are close, that their students are close contact. And um, that has that contact information on there also. So ODH and Green County Public Health are, are defining a close contact as somebody in the classroom or classroom, classroom like setting, such as cafeteria who's within six feet of the unmasked positive person. So that's what they are defining as the close contact. Last year, since everybody was wearing masks, it was three feet. That's what last year was. That was the guidance from last year. Um, the guidance actually stayed the same, but those are unmasked. Um, they were six feet last year, but three feet with masks. So that was their guidance last year. Additional information here, 90-day immunity. 
this continues to say the same to somebody that has tested positive, um, verified they're not required to quarantine if they're a close contact within those 90 days. Again, that hasn't that hasn't really changed um, from last year. Um, and again, the other all the other information has is has not changed. Only the ones in the yellow and really bits and pieces of the change and just clarification. Again, there's the flow chart in there that ODH has created, the fact sheet that goes along with the flow chart, um, and then the quarantine graphic that kind of explains um, um, if you're the close contact or not, it kind of graphically explains that. Any questions, board members, before we go on here? I have a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit further in detail, explain the differences about the authority of the school excluding versus Green County Public Health Quarantine? That's just not quite clear to me yet. Are we excluding based on their authority? Is it our own authority? Can you just flesh that out a little bit more, please? So again, we're supposed to be working with Green County Public Health officially quarantines the student, but we're supposed to be working with Green County Public Health if there is someone um, that falls under a contagious disease and, and or a close contact. So we're supposed to be working with them on that. They officially do the quarantine, however, because of their um, not getting to folks quickly enough, that if we wait on them to make that initial contact, it could be two, three days before they are contacted by Green County Public Health to officially quarantine them. And so um, they, by ORC, how revised code, Green County Public has that, Green County Public Health has that power to quarantine. But we can exclude in the time there and also work with Green County Public Health to quarantine. And what is it that gives us the authority to exclude? Working with the Green County Public Health. Um, that, that's the board policy, correct? Yeah. So I mean, again, I'm trying to read here. Uh, sure. I, well, look, and I, I may have the number wrong. I know it was in the 8,000 section. I think right. it was 8450. I apologize. I should have brought it. I looked up a board policy regarding uh, close contact with contagious diseases. Right. So again, if, if, if and that's so the contagious disease that's in our board policy to be able to exclude that student in the meantime. Again, if Green County Public Health was quicker, they would be making that initial call. If their manpower was substantially more, they would make that initial call. And we're, they are hoping that they can substantially um, decrease that amount of time before they call folks. It's just is not manageable of the close contact work that the school district do does of trying to to see who's a close contact or not. It, it, it takes hours. Like our administrators and nurses can attest to that. It takes hours, and we know the the, the classrooms, we know the the um, seating charts, and so they they could be able to do that if we I guess rely on Green County Public Health to do that. Again, I don't want to speak for them. They probably they, they may just throw up their arms and say, we can't figure this out, we're going to quarantine the whole room. But we're going to quarantine this whole section because we really can't figure it out. Again, I don't want to speak for them, but based on their um, lack of personnel, that they just they just can't get it done quickly enough. I understand. Yeah, I, yeah. I, just, I guess however it shakes out, I just want to make sure that I understand that we're not exceeding our legal authority or putting ourselves in any kind of legal trouble at all. I, just, I wasn't sure if it was an operating rule or if it was a board policy where I should be looking to, to learn the authority that we have to exclude until we're counting public health warranties. Right. So again, it is, um, so it's both in revised code and also in our board policy that we have the ability to be able to exclude that until Green County Public Health or the public, local public health agency is able to fully investigate and determine or not. Again, same thing with chicken pox. So if a student has chicken pox, it's the same same concept, same steps, that we wouldn't let that student and or those students that that student is around and expose them to, to come to school until Green County Public Health is being able to check that out. So the exclusion is our policy to make. We're not required by law to follow Green County Public Health. 
since they're two separate actions, two separate orders. Is that correct? Or what is understanding? We are required to work with Green County Public Health. Uh, if you don't mind switching gears, I just had a question. Um, the, the 90 day immunity in yellow. Um, has there been any discussion? I know you've been meeting with uh, the health department, which we all appreciate. Has there been any discussion about allowing proof of an antibody test to factor into the quarantine guidelines? I have not heard that discussed. I can talk with them about that. That has not come up in any conversation that we've had with them. Yeah, I, I'd like to get that conversation started um, just so I can learn more. Um, it seems to me that you know a vaccine uh, produces antibodies. It allows one's body to create antibodies. And I'm curious if somebody already has antibodies, then we could perhaps consider treating them just as somebody who's been vaccinated in regards to our quarantine guidelines or our exclusion guidelines. I can follow up with them on that. I appreciate that. Yep. I have one, um, I have one quick go back. Um, you mentioned. Uh, Green County Public Health having the authority to quarantine, and you um, said that's in the Ohio Revised Code. Could I recommend us adding that citation to our policy? Because it seems that a number of our families have reached out to Green County and are asking questions like we instruct them to. And Green County has anecdotally taken the position with some families that they don't have that power. Uh, Ohio mm -hmm. Department of Health. Anecdotally, it has also said that they do not have that power, and that makes me curious as to if only schools, which uh, have that power, which I don't feel that we do, to quarantine private schools, uh, who has the power to quarantine people who are not in school? Um, I find that to be a really odd position for them to take, and this is not on you. I'm just we know that citation that says they have that power. I would like to make sure that we all know where that is um, so that our parents are informed and, I guess, armed if need be when they start having these conversations and want to ask you know, questions. Ohio Revised Code 3707.08, when a person known to have been exposed to communicable disease, declared quarantinable by the Board of Health of the City or General Health District, um, board shop once restricts such person to his place of residence or other suitable place. And it goes on more so there. Can you repeat that? Yep. ORC 3707.08. Thank you. The board being the, the health board. The health board, yes. Yeah. Not, the not, the health board. not the school board. Um, what, what I gather, literally, you know, as I review the state guidance, as I review that provided by Green County Public Health, uh, there are a myriad of question marks that float over my head. Um, it's not clear. It's contradictory uh, in some respects. Uh, and it's rather frustrating, as frankly, as a community member, not necessarily as a board member, but not to be able to really understand this as well as I would like. Uh, it bothers me tremendously that our national, uh, state, and local officials, this is their job. This is their moment. This is their time to be on stage. And they're failing miserably uh, in their ability to convey to us in understandable ways what is a recommendation, what is a requirement, and there's a big difference. So I really would like to see Green County Public Health come out here, and we would like to hear a presentation from them. At least I would. The board can speak for itself here. Um, and I think it's time for them to stand on stage and do their job. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a health expert. I just find it very frustrating that I'm expected, we, the school system for that matter, are expected to enforce something that our own Board of, board of Health will not enforce. I can give you an example of where this can get really complicated. I went to Stephen Bell uh, two days ago. And first of all, let me say, I think uh, Mrs. Keaton and her staff are doing a phenomenal job over there. So this is by no means to be critical or criticize by anything they're doing over there in that school. They're, they're doing God's work and they're doing their best. Um, that said, even for the most ardent um, and compliant mask wearer, if we are going to follow the recommendations in, for, for quarantining, we're pretty much going to quarantine the whole district, or at least that whole school. 
because kids are within inches of each other, not three feet, not six feet, and they're not masked because I don't want anybody to eat and stay masked at the same time. So either we're going to follow the guidelines or we aren't. And so um, please keep in mind, COVID is real. Get a vaccine. Get the vaccine when you can. Uh, if I had a kid in school right now, we're saying is that from the board's perspective, we strongly recommend um, masks are worn. So with respect to my own children, if I had ones that could not be vaccinated, I would tell them to go to school with a mask. Now that said, I wouldn't vote it on and vote it off when they come home. I would say when you need a break, you take it down. When you're walking through the hallway, have it on. When you sit at your desk and you need to breathe or you need to you just had enough, take it off. You know, And uh, that will be my own personal position, not the board's position. I'm just giving you parent to parent talking here. Um, but I'm frustrated with the guidance from the federal, state, and local, and I think it's time for them to stand up to the plate, come out here and answer some questions. Fundamentally, it comes down to who's in charge, who has the authority, and um, and also exactly what is it? Is it three feet? Is it six feet? Is it three inches? As long as it's you know not for more than 14 minutes and 59 seconds in a 24-hour period, and so I just find it extremely frustrating, and I don't want to. And, during correspondence, I should have said something to them. Received a lot of email. I would try to respond to most of them, and some of you, I'm a pure student, I think all of you are in this regard. It kind of looked like a form response, right? But it was, because I think pretty much I have to have people wanting, uh, you know, mask or no mask. All I can say is thank you for your input. It's genuine. I read all of them and really pondered them, so please don't take offense at that. Um, but it's, it, it's hard as a school board member to try to, you know, you know, be on mission here and know what to do. Um, so, man, I, I, I want Green County Public Health out here. I don't know what the school board thinks on that. I guess we'll have some comment. That's my, my thoughts. Um, also, uh, it's the first bullet there, if I could add, I would like to see um, daily uh, updates, not not three every three days. I would like to, every day we know something. We either know, heard something or we didn't hear something. If we hear a positive, that's what I really care about. Quarantine, yeah, it, it, it has logistical impacts, but in many cases we are quarant in fact, in almost almost all cases we are quarantining healthy children. So that to me is not the trigger. The trigger for me is how many kids are actually getting infected. If we have one today, five tomorrow, two hundred next week, oh wow, you know, we got something going on. But the fact that we Right now, I have 152 kids quarantined. Is, is that a flag for me? No, because we're, we're applying quarantine guidance that is uncertain. It's subjective. It doesn't tell me a whole lot. But infection rates really mean something. It's it's a, it's objective. It's yes or no. So I would like to see this updated daily, and um, and also need to talk some more about whether we should have Green County Public Health. I will now be quiet for a couple minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Buzz, I want to continue. Or do you want to respond? Well, just to, to respond a little bit. So, again, I, the board would like me to update that more frequently. I can definitely do that. Um, so, that is, that is fine. It just is sometimes there's a day or two lag with things as people, you know, there's a positive on one day. Sometimes to work through all those close contacts and everything else, especially if it comes in at the end of the day, you know, it could take it could take a day to work through that a little bit. Um, and, and again, just trying to continue to have conversations and not try to, you know, have a discussion here and just making sure that, again, trying not to necessarily take one side or the other. Just again, we as as the school district and the and as the board. Are supposed to be following state and health department regulations, and, and that's in our board policy. And so, to con to control communicable diseases. So, again, some of these guidelines, I think, again, I'm surprised I would agree that you know some of them, where we get 15 minutes from, and, and so forth. And you know, at some point, someone had to to say 15 minutes is the magic number, it, whether it is or it is not. Um, but there, there has to be some type of, of guidelines or settings um, that we we have to follow, or it's 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 going to be a little troublesome to, to be able to follow them because other 
people will interpret things a little differently or won't or call on their own. So um, again, we, we just need to continue to keep those regulations and recommendations and so forth in mind as we kind of roll things out. Um, and then if we go to the next slide here, I can my, probably my next talking point. So here, here's the weekly updates. These are on our website. And so um, this is the first week of school. So there's a weekly update there. And again, if we continue to update more than weekly, obviously that would look a little different. And then there's our cumulative totals from the beginning of the school year. So again, obviously the first week of school, they're going to be the same numbers. So again, this does not include, again, these, these are only students that um, stepped in the first day of school. So we had students that over summer, we, were, we would categorize those as summer positives, not school positive. We started counting on 818, that's our first day of school. So we probably had about 20 positives that were called in that were summer positives. But that is not on our list because school hasn't, hadn't started yet. Okay, so we start counting on 818, anybody that's setting forth in our building at that point in time. And so those are the core teams associated with them. Uh, again, if you see like a number there in uh, Stephen Bell, why is there a student over there that there's no positive cases at Stephen Bell? It's probably a sibling. So that's where that is there being quarantined. Also, uh, we're subject to quarantine. So if we then go on to the next slide there, Mr. Bowles. Can we go on with sure. this one? Um, and the number of students quarantined, does that include the positive students? Because I they are also no, it doesn't. Okay, so nope, it doesn't include okay. the positive student. Thank you. Yep. Again, it also, good clarification there, it does not, so it, they, these are the students or staff that are quarantining at home. So as you work through the flow chart, there could be somebody that says, and, and it was verified, I was wearing a mask. They aren't quarantined at home, and so they're not on this list. These are subject to quarantine at home, not a, not a modified quarantine where they're still coming to school, but they're wearing a mask at school. So again, if you follow the flow chart, these are the folks, these are the students and staff that actually are subject to quarantine that we send that list to Green County Public Health. Okay. If you go on to the next week there, yep. So again, the first chart there is this week, 823 through 826, that's through um, today. And then obviously the cumulative total is at the bottom there. So um, you see our biggest number there is from Bell Creek Intermediate. And so we have six positives in six days at Bell Creek Intermediate. And, um, and that is, from a single source. So that is an example of spread within the school right there. That was from a single source that then impacted not all six students, but impacted uh, five, it impacted five students. How do we know that so, from a single okay. person? Don't put your hand up. Excuse me. me. No, no, it is not, sir. No, it is not. It is a, it's a school board meeting. It's our board meeting in the public. Okay. You have an opportunity to speak. All right. Thank you. So, um, so continuing on. So, 15 students were, were subject to quarantine due to that, due to those six cases. Again, there could be a case where there's no quarantine. There's no sub student subject to quarantine. They may have already been a close contact. They might have already been home. They might have not come to school. It might have been a weekend thing. Can we go back 48 hours? So um, those are the numbers for the first week and then the cumulative total numbers. Okay. And so the again, so the high school, for example, the first couple of weeks there, 47 is the, the students that are subject to quarantine. That the number of students that actually were a close contact, but then working them through the Flow chart and end up being 47. It's probably closer to 125 or 130 students that were maybe 150 that were eligible, but then working through this flow chart, 
they then were not quarantined, were not subject to quarantine at home. Okay. Um, just give you some uh, context from last year. The highest positive in a week last year is uh, in January, uh, week of January 25th, 21. It had uh, 13 positives. That was our highest week last year. So we had 14 this week. Um, and 33 students were quarantined for that. Um, and then in March 15th, that week of March 15th, uh, we had 13 also, then 95 students were quarantined to that situation. Um, and then also, week of uh, November 9th, we had 12 students that were positive. The highest quarantines in a week was the week of 11, 9th, November 9th, where we had 12 positives. 210 students were quarantined. And then uh, the week of November 2nd, again, this was all pre-Thanksgiving, if you remember back at that time. Um, and then we had 188 students in quarantine based on seven positives. So, again, some of these are um, due to um, lunchroom exposure, where obviously you can't wear a mask while you're eating. And so um, I know we had one or two students that were wearing a mask all day, and then they didn't wear a mask during, obviously, eating, and then um, they were sitting next to or near the positive student were subject to quarantine at that point. So we've been working diligently with um, Stephen Bell and BCI, Mr. Phelps and Mrs. Keaton, of trying to reconfigure our lunches to try to spread out students so that we can dramatically, dramatically decrease or eliminate the number of uh, kids that are subject to quarantine at the K-5 to level due to lunch. And so we're expand those lunch periods um, so that bit more so if a student is wearing a mask to school um, but then obviously is taking off through lunch they wouldn't be caught in that situation again. Okay. With respect to that though again with what I saw Stephen, Stephen Bell we're not going to get there. Um, you're, you're very much locked into a small gymnasium with you know children you know, 500 some kids have to go through there over I believe it's six uh, six periods, so you're running about 80, 90 kids through there in a small room, you know, probably a small gym, and so it's not going to happen. We're not going to have six feet distance between kids eating lunch. Uh, it's not going to happen. So uh, if we're going to rigidly apply recommendations for quarantining, we're going to see kids quarantine in great numbers throughout this year. So that's again the problem I have with the guidelines, their recommendations. In some cases, we treat them as though they're Ten Commandments. And otherwise, we take it as parental advice. And I just, uh, that's why I have a lot of problems with our current quarantine recommendations and not requirements. So uh, Stephen Bell can't get there. And again, it's not because of Mrs. Keaton or that staff. Again, they're doing wonderful work over there. But it's just the physics of the, of the reality of what we're facing. We have 600 kids over six periods going through there, and it can take, as I learned the other day, as I learned two days ago, it can take minutes on minutes, 30 minutes almost, to get really to just get them through line and have them sit down. Brandon went about bothering the line and have their masks on, so we quote unquote meet the criteria for, for not quarantining. Um, but, uh, but when they sit down, we're going to be faced with that. So I'm not sure what the solution is. I'm just throwing a problem on the table. But uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna avoid it if we're gonna be true to the quarantine recommendations. So I'm not sure how to handle that. There is no perfect solution. I mean, <clears throat> avoid is maybe a lucky goal or an unachievable goal. But minimize is a goal, and as much as they can spread out kids, if one positive case results in the children on either side of them having to quarantine, that's better than the seven that are seated around them. And so that's not to say that I don't disagree with you, Kevin, and that it, that might be a, a guarantee a parent uh, that if you send your child to school in a mask, that they 100% will not be quarantined. I think that is a guarantee we can't make. It's a guarantee we couldn't make if we had mandatory masking in that school because that child still has to take that mask off to eat lunch. But that said, we can do what we can 
to be creative and minimize those exposures to as few children as possible, whether that's allowing children to eat outdoors, whether that is um, switching up lunch periods, like you said you were um, attempting to do at BCI, so that um, we have more lunch periods and less children in those uh, rooms at once. Um, I think we should be doing everything we can to look across the board, not just in our lunch rooms, but in our classrooms, to do what we can to minimize um, situations for all our kids. I mean, that, if, if there are so, and some solutions that minimize are much more challenging than others. Some are easy fixes that we could do, and I think the kid could be at home for two weeks. Um, some are easy. Some some are much more intrusive. So. Um, Question regarding the um, you mentioned that uh, the high school the potential was higher than what had actually had to be quarantined, um, and was that? because of students wearing a mask were more likely to be because of they had received the vaccine? Both. Both. As, as they worked through the flow chart, those students came out as having been vaccinated or were wearing a mask. So that's why those numbers were dramatically reduced. Do we have any idea of the, of the um, uh, percentage of students who have gotten vaccinated? No. Um, I know for the staff, it's it's pretty high, pretty high number. Staff is probably 70s, low yeah. 70s. Okay. Yeah. But again, come October, that's irrelevant because we can't use vaccination status for quarantining or not quarantining or anything else. We have high hopes that uh, since they're updating their guidelines on a weekly basis, maybe we can influence that. I'm sorry? Since they're updating their guidelines on practically a weekly basis, perhaps we have opportunities to influence that. Well, I, I don't think we can because it's all. Well, it's not just a, it's not a recommendation, it's a law right, in October. Mr. Price, I'll, I'll, I'll investigate that further. I think that uh, school districts are not bound by that. That's not impacted by school districts. So uh, whether, you know, quote unquote, discriminate upon the vaccination piece. So I will further check on that, but just, I've been told that that doesn't really apply to school districts. So let me, let me write it down. Thank you. Dr. Kosan, thinking of last year, all the students we quarantined, and that was quite a few, how many ended up actually becoming COVID positive? From uh, just a, a guessment, probably a handful. So the major difference, you got to remember the major difference last year, we were hybrid for three, six, six, seven weeks, and also everybody was wearing a mask. So there's, there, there's, okay. there's both ways of looking at that, and so I hear what you're saying, but there is the other way of, of saying that. Awesome. What I was saying was I really wanted to know about one way or the Okay. Um, is there a way? Uh, there's something else I'd like to know uh, for two reasons. One, because I think that we should be empathetic, uh, empathetic in looking out for our kids, and that is how many of these positive students, and have we, I assume we have made contact with all their families and we're keeping in contact with their families. Do we know any of them to be significantly ill at this time. Not that I know of, no. Um, and I, I think it makes for better decision making if we can try to, and I know it won't be a perfect stat because symptomatic is different than significantly ill, is different than hospitalized, so I, I don't know the perfect solution, but a way where we can somehow, as we move forward, I know we didn't do this last year, but keep track of kids who are not just positive but are ill like truly having COVID issue um, because at some point I feel like uh, and, and that the opinions the medical opinions vary on uh, 
you know, how dangerous this is to children. But that said, I think that the current status out there is that this is a, a long-term thing we're dealing with. So we thought this was short, then it turned into a year, and now that they're talking spring or into next fall or into next spring, depending on how many people vaccinate and, and how many variants come and whatnot. If we are looking at this for a year, two years to come, we are going to have more decisions to make. And at some point, we are going to have to make those decisions based not just on cases, but on how ill children are becoming. And once, once vaccines are available to everyone, as they already are available to the highest risk populations, at some point we are, we as board, we as society, are going to have to make that switch if this does look like this is a long-term thing that we are dealing with. So I would like to have some measure of that, um, that for two reasons. One, because I think we should be keeping tabs on our children. I really want to know that if what we are doing is making kids sick, but I also want to have that information to make decisions as we move forward. No, I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, if I were to put a high-level summary of everything around the quarantine guidelines and COVID procedures, is I just want to make sure as a school board member that truly the health of our children is at the forefront of all of these discussions. Uh, it seems like sometimes a lot of the discussions are how can we minimize or get around or find loopholes for some of the guidelines and the recommendations, which I, I spent hours and hours on the phone with Green County Public Health asking them questions, and, and that kind of flows from there too. Um, you know, we've done, I love the out-of-the-box thinking. We've done some of that trying to figure out how can we maybe spread kids out in, in the cafeteria. One out-of-box idea that I know was mentioned, and I think this is a great idea, is maybe if it's possible, I don't know. You know, I, I have a nine-year-old boy. Um, he doesn't even chew his food. He just swallows it. Like, it takes him about 30 seconds to eat his peanut butter sandwich. Maybe once he's done with his food, he doesn't have to sit there shoulder to shoulder for 20 minutes or whatever it is in the cafeteria to go out of the playground. And I think that's a great idea. I love the out-of-box thinking. That's fantastic. Um, but at the same time, I, I do want there to be a balance. I want there to be a sense of perspective, um, such that if we're going to send children out for additional playground time, I know one stat is that every year there's over 200,000 children under the age of 14 who go to the hospital due to playground injuries. And we need to weigh that. I, I don't know the exact number, but the number of children that are hospitalized with COVID-19 is, is orders of magnitude less than that. So I just want to make sure that there's some perspective and that the health of our children are at the forefront. And I think that's a fantastic idea to, to keep track of so we can check in on our students and see who is becoming ill after the test positive. Audrey, I really like your suggestion. I guess the problem we run into, of course, with that is just um, you know, privacy. You know, can we get that type of information? Uh, I think we can certainly get the positives. Um, but I, I would absolutely love to see if I, what you're asking for. We got a positive, you know, half these people wound up and half these precious children wound up in, in the hospital. I really want to know that. Uh, if we can get access to that data, it would be very, very uh, important. But with HIPAA regulations, we, the limitations that right. we would need to uh, deal with, we could, we could get information that says, this is the number of, of cases that were reported positive. This was the um, this is how many students were able to return when the quarantine was officially up. This is the number of students who remain out beyond that quarantine right. period, which could give us some kind of indication without having to know specifically any information about individual students. And I can definitely dig into that again, just as we continue to you know, brainstorm solutions or thoughts or ideas, um, and, and really it, it, it pertains to whatever direction. Again, I think it's an understatement. It's a very complex situation. <laughs> I think it's an understatement. But at some point, what, whatever, whatever we're doing, wherever we end up, at some point it becomes unmanageable. You know, there's only so many people in our school district to do things. 
And at some point, it becomes unmanageable to collect this information, that information, this information. It's all very good information. And at some point, you know, again, whatever the information is, it just becomes unmanageable. And um, that, you know, the, you know, the, the tracking the close contacts is it's almost becoming unmanageable because as nurses are trying to do the regular job, they're trying to do those things also. And so whatever whatever direction we go anywhere, that it just is it's just an extra layer of work on every on everybody, including parents, including the school district, um, and so forth. So um, so again, we can dig into that a little bit. And but again, trying to how to track that, you know, what is you probably almost have to track symptoms or something because what's ill to me. Me feeling bad may be very different than you feeling bad. You know, I might have a very low tolerance for pain. You might have a very high tolerance for pain. And, and so it's just, you got to have, if we would go that direction, you got to be quantifiable, but also of just how much, how much information is too much information to collect. And so yeah, I'm not saying it's not a bad idea, just, uh, just it, it, any of this stuff, it's, you start digging deeper and deeper, and the information, it just becomes a lot of information. No, I can appreciate that, and I, there definitely would be a, uh, a definition required, and maybe that definition is hospitalization. I, I suspect our nurses would know that anyway. Our parents would yep. be reaching out. Sure. Our teachers would know if one of their students was in the hospital with COVID. Sure. Um, so... It, maybe that's the threshold. Those that's kind of, reasonable. That kind of thing. That, yeah, and, and, then, and when you discuss HIPAA, David, I, I, I'm not asking for that information to be presented on the dashboard. Oh, sure. I, I am yeah. asking just that you keep track of it so when the time for the next decision comes, it is available to us. No, I didn't think you were suggesting that. So <laughs> didn't mean to imply that. Okay. Right. Good questions. Back. Anything else as we move on? As we move on? Okay. We have a lot more, but um, okay. I honestly want to. I know a lot of people are here, and they want to speak, and they want to speak their mind, and I don't. I don't I go further, and so I want to listen. Sure. Okay. We continue on here. So again, just data and information. So if you add in or add, so we have about twenty-seven hundred students, seven hundred twenty, two thousand seven hundred students, around that range. They've been, in for, they've been in school for six school days. So this is the number of instructional days. So looking at from instructional days, not from number of students, but from instructional days, because one student quarantining might be quarantined for five, seven, 10 days. So this is the number of instructional days, okay? Just, uh, just information to look at. So um, we've had about 16,350 total days of school when you multiply that all out. So the total number of absences, we've had about 1,000 six days and so total number of days within that 1050 439 of those are because of quarantine now it might be because of quarantine from an in-school exposure but it might be quarantine from an out-of-school exposure we don't differentiate on that so it might be mom or dad are positive you are staying home quarantining you would be counted in this because you're you're coded as quarantine unexcused absences 100 and then excused absences 511. So you add all those together, and it's about 6% uh, of our days uh, students have been absent of the 16,000 or so days, and of the 16,000, the total number of quarantine days is 439. So about 2.7% of the total instructional days lost to quarantining is 2.69. Okay. Um, okay. Just again, just information there. Uh, continue on to the next one. Again, these are the guidelines by ODH. These are close contact guidelines. These are not positive student. What what is uh, what kind of categorizes close contact? These are the quarantine guidelines. So again, this is online. This is on our website. This is uh, this is all over the place. So this is from ODH quarantine for classroom settings. Again, we would categorize the cafeteria as a classroom setting just because people are sitting next to each other and so forth. So this is a flow chart that 
nurses would work with, with parents on. This is the flow chart that Green County Public Health would be using to determine ultimately would that student quarantine or not. Continuing on, this is just the dashboard from today, 5,000, this is state dashboard, 5,300 there is the last 24 hour reported. I think that's the highest in quite a long time. Um, I didn't have enough time to determine how long ago, I think spring, I think it's been the highest in spring. Um, January. Anybody, okay, thank you, January. So it's been uh, high there. Continuing on, and yeah, this is just data and information. So this is from today. So this is um, Green County data. So on 815, there was 415 positive cases over the last two weeks. So this is a two week look. 815, there's 415. Uh, on 819, there was 484, and then on 826 today, there's 938 cases over the past two weeks. So it's a two-week look of positive cases in Greene County. And I know we we sit next to Warren County and Montgomery County and so forth. So again, just information there. Uh, we, hold on before we go on here. Um, just looking at the zip code, so 45305, and again, I know that all Berkshire Creek Schools is more, more than just 45305, but just kind of looking at that. So on 815, we had about 21 cases. On 819, 33 cases. On 816, I'm sorry, 826, that's today, uh, 50 cases. So continuing to increase. Um, at uh, daycares and camps, uh, again, these kind of lag a little bit from but August 12th, there was zero. And on the 16th, there was three from day camps, day cares. Um, so again, just, again, tr I'm trying to provide information to the board and hopefully a lot of this information is helpful um, uh, because there's uh, either decisions to be made or discussions to be had and so forth. So again, uh, trying to navigate this very complex situation and very passionate situation as we can tell by the number of people on the crowd here um, uh, very passionate so again if you um, just look at some options uh, again I'm not recommending any of these options but you have to know what are some options out there before you can kind of work into yes I'd like to go that direction yes we'd like to explore that direction and so forth so if you don't know the options really don't know kind of um, what is out there. Again, there might be other options in these, but just uh, for conversation's sake. So you can go on to the next slide here. So option one, again, staying with mass recommended, but not required. So again, that could be option one. That's kind of, that's not kind of, that's where we're at right now. Um, we're highly recommending mass, but we're not requiring them. Um, option two, uh, again, mask mandate K to five or K to six. Option three, mask mandate six to twelve or seven to twelve. And just as I put those in there, obviously our schools, you know, a lot of sixth graders aren't old enough to get vaccinated. So that if, if those options are to be explored, you would either we'd have to determine do we do it by building or do we actually do it by um, grade level or by age. So again, different schools will do different things. Um, mass mandate option four there, mass mandate K to 12. Um, again, I, I probably don't have to go through all the school districts around our community that are doing a variation of these things. All, all four of these options, school districts in our geographical area are doing all four of these options. So again, there's no cookie cutter right way or correct way or the way to do it. People are all doing it all different ways. And then, yeah, these. Sorry, where are you going? Sure. I understand option two, but what the rationale would be for K to five or K to six. I do not understand. What would the rationale be for six to 12 or seven to 12? Um, 
that aligns with yeah. whether we agree with it or not, or individually, or right. as a board, but that aligns with the Academy of, uh, uh, of Pediatrics, I believe aligns with CDC recommendations uh, that universal masking in case we 12. Is that age 6 to 12? No, it's great. Right. So why would we mask our population that can be vaccinated yeah. and not mask our population that could not? Just providing all the okay. options. All right, and so, so we do a common. Just a weird option. It, it may be a weird option. Okay. okay. All right. Weird option. Sorry, right. I thought of Just going through all the options. Okay, thank you. Is, is there I hear what you're saying. So let's, let's move on to option five here. Okay. Um, option five, again, there may be other options out here. Option five is a temporary mask mandate, and maybe some of the things that we would do for that are temporary for two or four weeks, and or based on school specific numbers. And so you would look at each individual building or grade level or classroom and not do a one size fit all, but hey, this specific area is having some issues. We need to, uh, we need to put another layer of mitigation in there and, and mandate masks for temporary for two weeks, four weeks, um, based on positive numbers, based on quarantine numbers. And so again, just, Trying to so if you would go back again just just to give you some uh, context on that so Josh if you go back to the 823-26 slide slide number what four or so yeah so if you look at Stephen Bell they've had two positive cases and eight quarantine kids BCI six positive cases 50, 50 students are being quarantined. So again, I'm trying to provide some differentiator that hey, there's a lot more positivity going on at Bell Creek and not at Stephen Bell, or maybe in a particular classroom, and trying to not do a one size fit all, and just trying to uh, put another layer of mitigation and maybe a problem area. Um, again, board members, if there's another option, again, I'm just kind of throwing these options out here just to to provide discussion starters or to provide some some things to think about. Um, I received, you know, uh, some inputs. Obviously, we all did for parents, and there was one or two that were um, a bit different. Uh, in particular, I think one of the major concerns, not I think, I, I know, uh, is that our 11 and under children are unable to be vaccinated. Right. I think that's the the real crux of the matter here, uh, at least for a segment of our community and whatnot. So, but uh, one or two parents suggested a consideration for uh, mandatory masking uh, for that 1100 crowd until two months after vaccines become available for that age group. That allows time for once those vaccines become available, up to three weeks to go get the first one. Uh, I think it's then three weeks in between that if it's Pfizer, three weeks later they would get the second or so we anticipate based upon the way it's been uh, laid out so far for uh, older older children. And then and then finally uh, uh, two weeks to build the immunity. And at that point it, it, it's, it's an attempt to compromise uh, with those uh, parents that obviously clearly won't, don't want to wear a mask, but at the same time understanding the, the deep concern the heartfelt uh, concern of those parents that have to send their kids to school with what they feel is a great great level of risk. So rather than perpetual masking for maybe, Audrey, like you said, maybe we're going to be dealing with this maybe for two or three years, who knows? Um, I think it's gone, it comes back. Uh, but, it, you know, objectively, that 1100 crowd does not have an opportunity to be vaccinated. And one, eventually, when they can be, it truly becomes parent choice at that time, and then uh, they at least have an opportunity for what is widely recognized as an effective uh, barrier you know, to the virus. So uh, I think that's one. I don't. I don't know if we're brainstorming options here, and we're going to you know vote on them now or later or whatever. But I think that one needs to be kind of front and center in our considerations uh, because it, 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 it. I hate to use the word compromise here, but but we've got obviously some, some we're pulls apart in our community and with some segments, and this provides an opportunity to address, I think, a really keen concern of those that pay.
they have no control. Some other kid is coughing on them because they didn't wear a mask. They can't have, you know, uh, protection for the vaccine. They don't have built, uh, online academy this year, even as options. They feel trapped, and I can empathize with that. Um, sure. So I think that should be one of the options that are, if we're going to have layout options and ultimately vote on them, I think that is one that should be front and center. Sure, I'll add that. Yep. Can we ask a question? Yeah, bring back remote learning for the people that don't want their kids to be vaccinated or wear masks. Okay, okay so, so we're uh, going to go into our public communication time in just a moment. Chance to ask no. questions. Sorry. We will have a, we'll have the opportunity for people to speak here shortly. Okay. And in regards to that, though, I know a number of people are um, are signed up to speak. There are other options that you can think of. There are a lot of brains in this room, and no decisions have been made. None have been made by me personally. I can guarantee you that. Um, and, and I want to hear if you have another idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm not asking for it now. Um, yeah. Additionally, um, Dr. Cosette, I told you I was going to ask this question. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask it at this moment. But I do want to hear your recommendation and that of your uh, building principles. I, 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 I want to hear what you have to say. You are in those buildings every day. Your principals, your teachers are in those buildings every day. Uh, I I want to hear your recommendation, not at right now, if you are not prepared, uh, and there may be more options coming. But um, I would like your recommendation mm -hmm. because I, I very much value that and respect your opinion uh, regarding this. I would I would encourage um, board members at this point to say let's. Let's hold any further discussion on this topic until we hear from our community. Um, we do have a lot of people signed up. I, I do the, this, is, this is more relevant here. I did ask for essentially a, a special meeting at Green County Public Health come out, make a presentation on quarantine uh, protocols and recommendations and answer questions because we as board members through Sunshine Laws cannot go meet behind closed doors with Green County Public Health and ask them questions. So I'm every bit as much in the blind as what this, this, this audience is here today. So I would really love for my fellow board members, myself, to be able to have a meeting where we can have Green County Public Health up there. They make a presentation. We don't attack them, but we ask them very fair questions, like the three versus six feet in 15 minutes. That's the role player. So board members, please um, give me your feedback on whether you would like to see a special meeting where we, where we would ask Green County Public Health to come out. All right. With that on our, our discussion at item C. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll hold, uh, hold any further discussion on that topic until we heard from folks. But first, we do have our um, strategic plan presentation. So an update on the strategic plan. Yep. All right, so the administrators and I are going to present here. Um, again, it's been a clever project uh, with everyone involved here. So as we go along here, administrators are going to take, uh, they're each going to take some slides. And so if we, yep. So if we move on uh, to the next slide there, Mr. Bowles, I know you're handing out mics there. As you're, do, as you're doing that, um, again, we've been working on strategic plans since 2017, and it really has kind of evolved and, and um, revolved and evolved over the time here as we've tweaked and refined and really have uh, condensed it dramatically. I think it was overly ambitious uh, when we started that work before my arrival in 2017, and it was really ambitious, and so we've continued to try to refine it. and. To be honest with you, last year was just kind of on the back burner um, of uh, proactive work or on the plan. So, um, but the vision statement here and the mission statement, those have not changed. Those have been there from essentially from the beginning. And so, um, responsible decision makers, problem solvers, persevering, contributing, learning as a lifelong process. And so those are our mission statements and our vision statement. 
And really those flow right into the portrait of a graduate. And so the portrait of a graduate is, th those are the skills that we want our students to have when they graduate from Bellbrook, but also age appropriately when they go from Stephen Bell to BCI, when they go from BCI to the middle school, when they go from middle school to the high school, they need to have age appropriate um, uh, skills related to these particular areas. And so again, obviously, as a second grader to third grader, being a problem solver looks much differently than going from an eighth to ninth, but the same concept. So moving on to the next slide there, and that's our graphic, and that puts the vision and the mission there. And again, focusing obviously on our students, focusing on our families and communities, and focusing on our professional learners, our teachers and staff. And so, uh, next slide, working, so again, like I was saying, we're working revisions again in the spring and summer of 2021. And really where we came down to it, we have six district-wide areas and then three standalone areas. Each staff member is a part of those six building committees, each, each of those six district committees, so each staff member is on one of the committees. So we have two to three staff members also serving on that district level committee to try to get some vertical alignment there. And then the three standalone areas have district-wide committees but, but not building committees. And again, we'll, we'll flow through these in just a minute. So each area has objectives, measures for success, and timelines for implementation. And obviously we're going to be spending some time on these during our professional development days, along with other things, we're going to be spending time on our strategic plan during some professional development days. Ms. Gant, do you want to go to the next slide then? Sure. Yep. Um, the district councils, as Dr. Kozad mentioned, we have six district councils, and you'll see those titles and goals and measures of success coming up on future slides. Each teacher in the district will have an opportunity to be on a building level committee that's aligned to those district council goals. And at the building level, that's where timelines, action steps, and um, activities will come to life in the building that align to the students they serve, age groups, and the particular needs of that staff and student body. Good evening, members of the board, staff, parents, families. I'm Donnie Phelps. I'm the new principal at Bell Creek, and uh, I'm here to talk to you this evening about authentic learning and how that fits into our strategic plan. And I'm very excited to talk about that because as a an educator very recently removed from the classroom into the building leadership role as a lead learner at Bell Creek, uh, this is something that I am particularly passionate about. Um, we were slightly delayed in our progress in this area because of the pandemic. But prior to the pandemic, probably the biggest initiative involved with authentic learning was our project-based learning training. And as a teacher, I was able to participate in that. So when you hear authentic learning, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's real learning and you know, all of us have probably at some point sat in a classroom and wanted to ask the teacher, why do we have to learn this? When am I ever going to use this in my life? I know I had that experience as a student. That's probably why I went on to study Spanish and, and literature and writing the way I did, because that was the first time that I really felt like I was getting an authentic, real-world skill that I could take out of the classroom and use. So that is what we're trying to achieve here, is to give students those opportunities to solve real-world problems, to apply critical thinking skills, to work collaboratively, build 21st century learner skills, and do authentic things, presenting, practicing their uh, speaking and listening skills that are embedded, writing and reading across the curriculum, and demonstrating true content mastery and knowledge in real world ways. Hello, for those who don't know me, I'm Todd Whalen. I'm uh, one of the assistant principals at the high school. Uh, and I'm on the Data Informed Instruction Committee. Uh, and as you can see, the goal of the Data Informed Instruction Committee is to ensure that academic excellence will be pursued through a well-rounded, academically rigorous, personalized, and relevant student experience. Uh, in order to meet this goal, the district's going to focus on two things. 
the first is the implementation of the artist and teacher. Uh, this is a philosophy for instructional coaching within the district. Many members of our administrative team have already participated in professional development series targeted at providing positive feedback to teachers and staff members in a timely and efficient manner. Uh, our committee will also participate in an artisan teacher book study in an effort to facilitate a common understanding and language of the philosophy district-wide. Uh, and then finally, related to the artisan teacher, our middle school will facilitate a peer-to-peer -peer observation model that will allow teachers to observe each other and reflect on the effectiveness of instructional practices within the classroom. Uh, the second focal point is the creation of a curri curriculum resources plan. Uh, that's meant to promote consistency among subject areas, departments, and buildings regarding instructional practices. Uh, this includes action items such as the construction of curriculum maps, as well as the development of subject area philosophies and common assessments. Um, as an initial effort to identify where the district is within these processes, Ms. Gann, uh, our Director of Curriculum and Gifted Services, will conduct a curriculum audit during the first semester. Uh, and with, with that said, I will turn it over to her for equity. Thank you. I'm the chairperson of the district level equity council. And you can see there the overarching goal. Um, student support, school climate and culture are essential to achieving equity and opportunity. When properly deployed, holistic support can improve the likelihood of student success. These words come directly from the Ohio Department of Education from their strategic plan. The council's measures of success are provided there with the bullet points. And we came to those uh, measures of success by examining lots of different district strategic plans in the area of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the, the council felt that those two really captured the goals that we wanted to pursue. Examples of the council's work include book studies, podcast studies, um, equity roundtable discussions in the buildings. We've facilitated uh, teacher-led discussions, optional attendance uh, where people gathered, and we had great numbers of people gathered at the table to have equity conversations in each building. Another example is an action item that has gained traction, uh, including expanding our book selections for students. We have more diverse representation now in our choices of books, both in the classroom and in the libraries. And our, one of our English language learner teachers, Michael Garrison, recently, uh, with grant money, got a lot of great books that have um, multi-age appeal, multicultural selections, so that our teachers and students have a lot more to choose from and can hopefully find something that they can identify with more readily. We also plan to support families in a better way whose home language is one other than the English language. School life can be difficult to navigate for folks who do not speak English as their native language, so forms, all the electronic kinds of things that uh, new families to the district have to navigate. We're going to do a better job in that area. Also communicating extracurricular and athletic opportunities to families. We've also engaged informally with Sugar Creek Cares a local group of community members and parents that are committed to equity issues. Dr. Koza and I, for example, met with Sugar Creek Cares in February along with a lot of other community representatives and public servants here in uh, Sugar Creek and Belburn. Members of the Equity Council and uh, the District Level Council met informally with Sugar Creek Cares this summer in a listening session developing our relationships, sharing opportunities and resources, and we even uh, joined each other, Sugar Creek Cares and many of our council members, and attended an event at the Dayton Metro Library early in August called Undesign the Red Line Exhibit, which really explored the history of redlining in the Dayton area in particular. Um, that practice uh, kept people of color from home ownership well into the 70s, so we learned a lot about that. 
Most recently, we had some teacher-led discussions around culturally responsive practices and vocabulary. Um, the words that we choose do matter, and we can be intentionally more inclusive by uh, incorporating specific language. And we look forward to our building level committees taking this to the next level. We have teachers, uh, many, many have volunteered to be on the building level equity committee so they can continue this work for students and staff. I'll turn it over to Josh Bowles for technology. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Josh Bowles, I'm the district technology coordinator. Um, the technology focus of, of the, the different focal points of technology with respect to our strategic plan, there are two kind of main focal points. Um, and the first, the most important one, is really how we are integrating technology into our classrooms. How our students are experiencing the technology that we put in front of them. How our teachers are using it to help improve educational outcomes. Um, so last year, we actually provided some targeted professional development uh, to provide the teachers in this district with a model to support enhanced technology integration. Uh, it helps us uh, kind of have a common language as we discuss technology around the district. Uh, and hopefully this year we will find the time to build on that professional development work that we did last year um, to help uh, teachers take lessons that they are familiar with teaching and then work them through a plan to help them integrate technology a little bit more deeply, again, to improve those learning outcomes. Um, technology use in a classroom can be a very exciting thing for students, but it has to be related to educational outcomes. That is critical uh, for any technology plan that a district is willing to embrace. Um, the second part is more kind of nuts and bolts. Uh, district technology resources, our hardware, our software, our infrastructure, um, our, our measure for success there is that we will optimize all of those to support district operations across all departments with an emphasis on stability and security. Uh, cybersecurity, obviously, with the pandemic and everything else, has become an enormous subject to tackle these days. Uh, and public schools in particular, the cyber attacks on public schools have increased by a very dramatic percentage over the past two years. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that was reflected in our strategic plan, that we are doing our best to keep up with those trends uh, and to keep all the information and the data and the technology within this district safe and secure. All right, uh, I'm Jenna Hill, again. I'm the assistant principal at the middle school. So I'm gonna talk just briefly here about community engagement. Um, and this kind of stems from one of the original titles being uh, communication. So we are going to obviously continue our district use of Facebook and then the different building or group accounts on Twitter and Instagram as well. Uh, it's just a really great quick snapshot of the awesome things that our kids are doing every day and that our teachers and staff uh, are able to do on a regular basis. One of the uh, main things this community wanted to focus on though was how do we communicate to our community as a whole, not just parents. Uh, each building does an awesome job of creating their either weekly or monthly newsletter, but that only goes out to our parents and we want to make sure the community as a whole knows about the great things going on in the schools that they support. Um, so two ideas kind of came out of that, one of which is actually going to kick off September 8th uh, right here in the middle school. It's going to be part of what we're calling our Open the Door series where we are inviting local groups to come in and offer some sort of education. So our very first one, we're actually partnering with Bellbrook Gardening Club and through their support they are bringing in uh, a master gardener uh, from the Ohio State University, and he is going to be educating for free anyone that wants to join us here uh, about how to winterize our gardens and uh, lawns and ponds and things like that. So we've been brainstorming a ton of ideas. Uh, another one was looking at um, offering some sort of tech help and tech support uh, for parents, as it seems every day there's a new app, something's changing, how do we kind of help parents stay on top of that? So different things like that, so be looking for that, but uh, September 8th is our first one there. And then the other idea is, again, with uh, building principals putting out their weekly or monthly newsletters, trying to find a way to condense that into sort of a one-pager and being able to print it and just place it strategically uh, in businesses and uh, locations around the district so that that's going out in another way besides just email to parents. Good 
Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Good evening, everyone. You are great listeners. We are almost done. Mrs. Lasota and I are going to speak K-12 collectively, and we're going to talk about whole child instruction. So we're going to begin with a multi-tiered instructional support. This framework talks about the whole child in regards to their academic as well as their social-emotional support. So at Stephen Bell Elementary, where myself and our wonderful staff are focusing on the children, I see a lot of familiar faces, some parents in the room tonight, former parents, thank you for being here. Our children are participating right now in the academic map, which is the measures of academic progress that shows their readiness in math, reading, and math. And that is one way that we assess their readiness for the areas, like I said, in math, for math and reading. And when we look at that, we are looking at the continuum as to how they're performing academically. For the social emotional learning, for K to two, we are looking at where their needs are. We have character kid circles going on at Stephen Bell. We do that weekly. And the Ohio Department of Education has competency standards that are put into place. There are five different areas that the state standards look at. And they're looking at like spatial awareness, social awareness, how do the children get along? How do they um, anticipate their whole body language? Those are just a few examples. And so the teachers at Stephen Bell have looked at those character kid lessons with our wonderful guidance counselor, Mrs. Snipper, and we looked at those state standards that are expected of us, and we did a cross analysis, and we embedded those standards into our character kid lessons that we were already incorporating. And so we also have interactive read-alouds that are naturally happening within the classrooms. And that is part of our reading program, Fonta Sipanel, which is a national research-based program. So we're very fortunate that that's already occurring at Stephen Bell Elementary. To take it one step further, Mrs. Chad, our curriculum director, sorry, Mrs. Chad, Mrs. Gain, old habit, so Mrs. Gain, went ahead and did a pilot um, coordination with Montgomery County ESC. And now we have teachers in grades two through five. So Mr. Phelps and I and Mrs. Gain are doing a pilot study. And we have teachers that are volunteering. And they are going to embed the social emotional learning into their writing. This is a free area, so no charge to the district, and it will be, like I said, embedded into their writing and during their morning meetings. So we just wanted the board to know and for the community to know that when we're looking at the whole child, we're talking about their academic needs as well as their social and emotional needs. And then I'll turn it over for grades 6 through 12. Hello, I'm Mickey Lasota. I'm the other assistant principal at the high school. Um, what we do at the high school, we do do map testing as well um, through mainly 10th grade for reading and uh, geometry as the highest level for math. Um, we also have Google Classroom that we use for academics, but we also use that for to connect with the students, to give them a space where they know they can go find um, some social emotional support, um, just where they can connect with anyone that they need to. Um, we also have over 40 opportunities for um, academic, athletic, artistic, and service activities, uh, including supportive peers. Um, we have a we are at the high school, at the middle school currently. Miss Hills started a um, stop program where she communicates, gives the students have, not she, but the students have the opportunity to fill out a form, 
um, where they are answering questions about their academics, attendance, goal setting, social, emotional, well check type of things. Um, and we are looking to continue that at the high school as well. Right now, we want to make sure that our kids have opportunities to get the help both socially, emotionally, and academically. Uh, we do have the Mindful Moments Room, which is available to all students. Um, you know, in the, in the end, our goal right now is to keep your kids in school and support them however we can as we're going through this crazy time. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Hanna, I'm principal of Delaware High School, and I'm going to talk about our positive learning culture. Uh, after several stops and starts due to the pandemic, our district has partnered with Focus 3 uh, to develop a system, a plan, a kind of a, a, detailed, a detailed plan to help us soar even higher. Uh, the Focus 3 program can be tailored to all levels of students and development, anywhere from Stephen Bell up through the high school. Um, Focus 3 and its tenants, uh, plus R equals O, uh, the R factor are applicable to pretty much any situation and uh, will help us provide a consistent message and expectation of behaviors and skills and also provide a common language in our buildings and also in our community. Uh, there's not a lot of new things in Focus 3, new ideas. Um, there's nothing in the system that we don't already know or believe, but what it does do is gives us a simple, clear, and actionable system um, to help implement those beliefs. Uh, in summary, uh, we're a great district, um, but there are many great districts. Uh, we want to be different, we want to push ourselves to be uncommon, uh, we want to be elite, not just locally or in the state, but nationally, and we believe that this initiative can help us reach those goals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette Sigmund. I'm the manager of business, and I had no idea so many people would be here tonight because they wanted to hear about our strategic plan. That's really nice. <laughs> I'm here to talk about safety. Um, each building has a very comprehensive safety plan on file with the Ohio Department of Education. It's revised every three years, and it's reviewed annually. And I remember when we did this 85-page document per building, the last time I filed it two years ago, talking about pandemic, I'm like, we are going to reuse that. Well, <laughs> three months later, we were following our plan. So um, it is very comprehensive, from earthquakes to pandemics. Um, also, then we have our safety committee that Kevin was talking about earlier that is comprised of our Bellbrook Police and Fire Departments, our Sugar Creek Police and Fire Departments, because two of our buildings are in the city of Bellbrook, and two of our buildings are in Sugar Creek Township. So they work collaboratively with us, as well as um, board member, administrators, transportation, food service, and we meet twice a year to talk about any safety issues. For example, the change in the traffic pattern at BCI was a result of the safety thing um, committee meeting last year. I know it was right the first day, but now it's working really good because we had to train all the parents, and it's, it's really working well. But that was a result of that because we had safety concerns of parents parked on the roadways to pick up their children in the school day, and we've resolved that issue. We've also talked about the crosswalks, and that's why we have adult crossing guards there. And um, our next meeting in September, we're going to be looking at maybe possibly implementing school safety patrols and um, purchasing more radios in case of an emergency for all our administrators to be able to talk to each other on a private radio wave. And then ultimately looking at maybe our security systems in our building. We need to upgrade our security cameras and door systems. So that's about safety. And lastly, finances, develop a financial plan to ensure short and long-term stability, to provide a world-class educational program. Um, again, utilizing our five-year forecast to evaluate both the short and long-term funding and spending needs. And I don't have to tell you that we currently passed a, just passed levy in May, and that was part of looking at five-year forecasts and seeing those uh, needs on that five-year forecast. Also establishing that financial advisory committee, as Mrs. Dorn uh, talked about earlier. And so communicating with those folks and presenting our financial information to them and getting feedback. Also providing unified, adopting unified practices and cross-training within the treasurer's office. Um, so to increase their consistency and technology. And, and lastly, periodically communicate finances to stakeholders via board meetings, um, the bridge, and, and uh, so forth. So making sure that the community is staying 
on top of our financial situation. And so that's that's all we have our strategic plan. Great, thank you. Yep. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think it, for the future, what would be great is to uh, maybe periodically dig a little deeper into one of the uh, one of the different areas and um, get a little little further into into the topic um, when we have the opportunity to just look at one. That's it for the overview. Thank you so very, very much. Um, board members, any other comments? I agree, David. You've interested me enough, and now I want to ask. 50 questions, but I'm pretty sure that I would be hung if I did. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I know this was this is a specially scheduled meeting, and this is this is supposed to be the main event, folks. Yes. So I'm kind of disappointed that we aren't able to ask each of you so many questions, so many questions that I have. Um, so I would like to. Either periodically Absolutely. hit each topic yes. or schedule another special meeting where we can actually talk about you know, education at the Board of Education meeting. Um, and I, I don't say that flippant, but truly, I, we were just, I've, I've been on this board since January, and we, we have Our, not had much opportunity to talk about education. education. Right. Um, For so long, it was uh, finance that we had to talk about. Uh, and now we Pandemic. Political issues and pandemic, and um, yeah, I, I really look forward to the opportunity to get back to our core mission. Absolutely, I do too. Um, when you have another uh, topic uh, for talking about community chats, but before we do that, we've, we've been in here for an hour and 45 minutes, um, so let's take a five minute uh, restroom break, stand up, stretch, whatever, and then we'll continue.
All right, we're going to skip the community chats and go to our open communication period. Um, there, we do have uh, 20 some folks signed up to speak. Uh, our board policy says that you know we're limited to 15, or we can limit to 15 minutes per topic, um, three minutes per speaker. I would, um, I will uh, keep a, a time on speakers. Uh, I won't interrupt anybody at the very end and ask you to stop or anything like that. I'll give you a signal that your time is you know, getting close. And we will let all speaker, all persons who have signed up to speak this evening. Um, I do ask, um, because um, uh, each of us up here is using their own individual microphone, we will, I will ask that uh, we have some, uh, I saw wipes up there by the microphone. If you, would, uh, if you choose to uh, wipe, it, wipe it off before you start, that would be great. That would um, help prevent any potential spread of germs. And um, we'll uh, actually go, we will go in order according to how how people signed up, or how I understand people have signed up. So we will begin with uh, Susan and Mike Gard. No, hang on a second. We had uh, a we person needed to a, speak first. I know, and under circumstances, there'll be still plenty of time. Thank you, sir. We are here to share why we are adamantly opposed to our students, particularly our district's elementary age students who are required to wear a mask all day at school. Our position has solely to do with the education, or more importantly, the disruption to our son's social, emotional, and academic education. We looked for valid, credible research to explain our position. It was not hard but to find. We will cite from two scholarly reviews found on the National Center for Biotechnology Information website. The NCBI is part of the United States National Library of Medicine. It is approved and funded by the government of the United States. Most of what we will share is from the article, Mask Education, the benefits and burdens of wearing face masks in schools during the current corona pandemic. The article begins, face masks can prevent the spread of the virus, then proceeds. However, covering the lower half of the face reduces the ability to communicate, interpret, and mimic the expressions of those with whom we interact. Emotionality in general is reduced, and thereby bonding between teachers and learners, group cohesion, and learning and concluding, the benefits and burdens of face masks in schools should be seriously considered and made obvious and clear to teachers and students. It continues to list pros and cons to face masks and concludes, given these pros and cons, it is not clear whether face masks should play a major role in educational settings. Continuing, the article lists many concerns of wearing face masks and concludes, whereas face masks are intended to ease the burden of the pandemic, they may at the same time make it worse under certain situations. Also, it states, for effective verbal communication, covering the mouth with cloth has two detrimental consequences. The article proceeds to go into detail and conclude, because speech transmission is impaired by mask wearing, there is a risk of misunderstanding when face masks are used widely in schools. Our ability to understand people is reduced considerably. And finally, the article states, the outward emotional displays of one's fierce faces is a critical and necessary component of social interaction in schools. Therefore, at the very least, all school professionals should be aware of the detrimental effects of face masks on face recognition and identification, communication, and social emotional interaction. From the second article, we'll share just one point. After much detail, it states, face masks are more likely to hamper the education of the primary, children 12 and under, students than secondary school children, given the focus on learning, basic speaking, and social skills. During the 2021 school year, our son wore his mask from 7.05 until 3.25, with the exception of two short mask breaks and lunch. During the eight hours and 20 minutes away from home, he wore his mask for seven hours and 40 minutes. At the last board meeting, many parents spoke about their desire for you to mask our school so that they could be heard and understood. All but one of those speakers removed their mask before addressing you. During the 2021 school year, teachers and students were not given the option to remove their mask to be heard or to be understood. I hear a lot about safety for our kids. I am concerned for the safety of my child. 
But after 18 months of masking, it is time that education gets weighed into on this decision. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate everyone's enthusiasm, but please let's stick to just applause. No, we don't want to be a viral um, video on uh, YouTube. So let's just, let's just stick with polite applause, if that's your uh, choice. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the next, uh, Joel Mansfield with, um, with the topic of layer protection approach for COVID prevention. Hello, thank you. Uh, can everybody understand me? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, I'll try to be as clear as possible um, when I'm talking. Yeah, again, my name is Joel Mansfield. I have three children here at the school. At the school. Um, and I'm going to talk about a layered approach to prevent COVID. So uh, I'm, also, <clears throat> I'm also a systems engineer, so I, I enjoy spending a lot of time kind of bringing pieces and parts together to solve problems. And so this was interesting to me. And I, uh, I'm here basically just for the purpose of the health and well-being of my children, uh, but also the greater community and family. Um, but the current situation is that uh, the state of Ohio has left the COVID-19 prevention strategies um, mostly up to the local school districts. Um, so that means this board has the responsibility to make a decision to implement uh, a masking policy, a universal masking policy. So um, currently, um, recommendations exist uh, from both uh, policy-making organizations, such as the U.S and State Department of Education, um, and also experts such as the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and the Center for Disease Control. So <clears throat> all of these recommendations include utilizing a layered approach uh, to prevent uh, COVID spread. Uh, the goal being to reduce the number of viral particles that can make it into uh, individual lungs. Right? Um, so these layers of protection are uh, vaccination, so uh, my kids uh, and many others 12 and under are not eligible yet for the vaccination. Uh, social distancing, uh, that is determined by the constraints of the building size and the uh, number of kids that have to fit into that building. Obviously, you guys are working towards that, so I appreciate uh, thinking out of the box on that. Uh, ventilation, um, so and again, that's determined by the building age, maintenance, when you're available to be retrofits, and all of those things. I don't really know where that stands, but um, that's another important measure. Uh, hygiene, um, which in general is, is, is good for many things uh, health-related, but it's kind of a low uh, impact on airborne particles, so it doesn't have much effect. Um, and then lastly, uh, universal masking. So uh, that's really the only thing left uh, other outside of major uh, modifications to buildings. Um, that we have control over. And so universal masking is important uh, as, as that final piece uh, to be able to uh, reduce you know, overall uh, transmission. So um, I'd just like uh, everybody to kind of think about that and how that works and uh, consider you know, what we can do uh, as a community to, to help our kids. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Diana Evening. Evening. Now, there's been a lot of confusion regarding the role of the Board of Education plays in the safety of the children and its parents. Some of the board members aren't really sure whether it's the superintendent that makes the policy on mandates for masks or whether it's the board themselves. So I've actually printed out 8450 of your board policy to read to you. The Board of Education recognizes that control of the spread of communicable disease spread through the casual contact is essential to the well-being of the school community and to the efficient district operation. So your own board policy says that you guys recognize that spreading disease within our buildings 
is important to mitigate because it interrupts our ability to educate students. For purposes of this policy, casual contact communicable disease shall include diphtheria, scarlet fever, and other strep infections, whooping cough, mumps, measles, rubella, other designations by the Ohio Department of Public Health. Have you guys checked to see whether or not COVID counts? I would assume at this point it counts as a communicable disease if all of these others fit in. In order to protect the health and safety of the students, district personnel, and the community at large, because public health is a matter of all of us, not just one individual family or one individual child, the board shall follow all the state statutes and the health department regulations which pertain to immunization and other means for controlling casual contact communicable disease spread through normal interaction in school settings. So other than telling parents it's up to you, what exactly other means for controlling casual contact communicable disease spread have you used? If a student exhibits symptoms of a casual contact communicable disease, the principal will isolate the student in the building and contact the parent guardian. Protocols established by the county health department shall be followed. So that kind of goes to your quarantining discussion earlier. This is your board policy. This is your job as defined by you. You're not really following it. <laughs> It is your job to demonstrate that you're following the health department's strong recommendations by displaying the health behaviors they're recommending to the students in your care, at the very least. It's also your job to follow other means for controlling spread in this district. Up to this point, you haven't done this. So you let this casual communicable disease kind of have its way with the school district because no mitigation factors are at play. So it's time we'd like, as a community, I'm sure, to see you guys actually follow your own board policy. That it demands that you guys actually make district policies or district choices that actually control the spread of anything. So I will leave you with that in your own words. You guys can Google it it's on the website. Good luck. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by asking all of you to close your eyes as I make my statement and see if you can receive my communication. In January of this year, we moved our children to a private school. We didn't make this choice because Bellbrook didn't meet our children's educational needs. In fact, in quite a few ways, we wish we had never had to leave. There are programs and opportunities here that expensive private schools do not have, and relationships we had for years with our children's teachers were invaluable to who they are today. But we face a hard choice. As it did for many other children in the community, Bellbrook Online failed our kids. We don't blame the district for that. We all made the best choices we could at the time. But while we wouldn't put them through that again, we couldn't put them back to school in person during a time when new quarantines were being announced every few days. Students deserve consistency in their education. And the best place for them to be is in the schools. And because we have the privilege to do so, we moved our kids to a place where they have that consistency. In their new school, there has been negligible number of quarantines. This school has also continuously required masks since very early on in the pandemic, along with other reasonable mitigation steps. That takes us here to today. Things have changed, but not for the better. Delta isn't last May's COVID. And one week into school, we're already seeing school spread. Large numbers of quarantines due to close contact with COVID-positive children. And kids are being asked to stay home without an adequate way for them to keep up with classwork. Doctors from this community have stood before you and asked you to reconsider your policies because they couldn't choose to remain in the district without some stronger COVID mitigation plan from our schools. We know a couple of them who have joined our children. Up to now, the decisions of this district have convinced us that we are entirely justified in our choice. But most parents aren't as fortunate. And I'm here speaking for them. My wife and I have contacted several of you individually to urge you to reconsider your back to school safety positions. Even if masks do nothing to stop transmission, and I'm not willing to grant you that, but let's pretend, even if, 
Ohio Department of Health requirements state that unmasked children must quarantine after close contact with a positive case. Your mission should be to keep kids safely in school, so the path should be clear. Under current ODH requirements, if children can't be socially distanced, then they must remain masked. Those are the options, following the best guidance experts can give us, the strong recommendations of the Ohio governor, and at this point, the leaders of nearly every peer school in our surrounding area, who have all shown their respect for that expertise. A number of you have stated that you'd much rather see masks return than hybrid learning. I think you've reached that decision point because our quarantine numbers say something needs to be done. On the topic of numbers, some have pointed out that COVID is entirely survivable. The likelihood of death is so small and most people feel like they had a common cold before getting well. That may be true. But I think it's important to remind the board about the law of large numbers and remember that we are a community. It's not just me. I am not personally worried that I will die from COVID. I'm vaccinated and I'm confident that I can roll a very large roulette wheel and not land on the green space. What I'm not willing to do is bet that this entire region can, that this entire district can, my neighbors, our school, or even this room. How many spins can we make before we land on green? Now imagine that some of us, those of us who are most vulnerable and many of whom cannot get vaccinated have issues that magnify their risk. If this ball lands on an even red number, they're dead. Each person in this room took one spin. If that ball lands wrong, would you be willing to look that person in the eye and tell them that their death is required? That we couldn't take even the smallest steps to try and prevent that person's death. Maybe we can spin the wheel that many times safely, maybe we can't, but I'm almost done, so forgive me. I can't put myself into that position, and so I will not. I stand here today still urging you to reconsider your positions because I cannot look my community in the eye and tell them I did didn't do everything I could to keep us safe in school with our children receiving the education every child deserves. This is your moment. This is your job. This is when you step up as leaders or you don't. Thank you very much. All right, Cassie Kipling. Pardon me? Who, who is it? Cassie Kipling. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking that. And just before I start, I've already heard grumblings. Yes, I do have a COVID positive child at home who is in isolation. I am vaccinated. I have followed all of the guidelines that I am supposed to follow to be here tonight. I have double masks and I have stayed in the back of the room. I am not here to talk to you about masking tonight. I wish I were. I am here because after the July 8th board meeting, I took it upon myself to begin circulating a petition around the community to determine interest in bringing back additional busing to the district. Everything I did was by word of mouth court and coordination on Facebook. I was not given permission to post on the community billboard page, even though the issue affects the entire community. This limited, amount of, this limited the amount of people I could personally reach. I have spoken with countless parents that are struggling to figure out how to get their, their kids to multiple buildings and navigate the congestion caused by increased parents on the roads. Many parents have been faced with the issue allowing their teams to, allowing their teams to ride to school with inexperienced drivers or having their kid, having to leave their kid outside the building for 40 minutes prior to the start of the school day just so they can make it work on time. The community is telling you we want to bring back additional busing and we want to ensure the students at the high school have access to busing as well. The Bellbrook School Board Policy Manual Section 8000, subsection 8600, last revised December 13, 2007, states, children living beyond the following walking limits shall be entitled to transportation. Kindergarten, one mile. Grades one through five, one mile. Grades six through eight, one mile. Exceptions to foregoing limits may be made in case of temporary or permanently disabled child who has been so certified by a physician and in case of adverse safety conditions. The board is in direct violation of its own policy and has been for more than two years since the inclusion policies were instated. 
limited sidewalks, limited crosswalks, no street lights, dangerous intersections, all add up to adverse safety conditions. This time with the board and this administration to figure out a way to bring back additional busing. Currently we have 18 buses being used for BCI and the middle school bus routes. We have another one that could be used, but we need a driver. There are nine buses being used for the Stephen Bell routes. If we have buses, why do we have an exclusion zone for Stephen Bell? Some of the buses are not being used to their full capacity. We are currently segregating students with special needs from the rest of the students in the community. Just because a student has an IEP that requires aid does not mean that, that student should not be riding the bus with their peers. I have personally spoken with parents of these children, and they informed me that two separate buses arrive at their house. One to pick up their child with special needs, and one to pick up their other children. Why? These are extremely valuable seats on buses that are not being filled. The goal of this community should be to foster acceptance among those that have differences, and we are separating the students from the peers. In July, I showed each of her, in July, I showed each of you at the school was not doing a good job of advertising the fact that we need bus drivers. The school employment page still does not show the need for drivers. There's no longer an add-on on deed, and there have been emails sent out for the need of food service workers, but not bus drivers. You cannot claim this is a problem unless you're actually looking for a solution. Tonight, I'll be emailing each of you the copy of the petition that I circulated the past six weeks. And it contained over 300 signatures. And there are still more individuals I was unable to meet up with. Roughly one third of the individuals that signed the petition do not have a child in the district, but they view this as a community issue. I would have gotten more, but COVID happened. This is something the community both wants and needs. I've gone to great lengths to show you the support for this issue the district is no longer in the same financial trouble we were two years ago. It is time that you all start actively working to find a solution. Thank you. Cassie, I have a question for you. Um, the, the challenge for the district will be um, to quantify the needs. You know, and so you know, if it goes out six miles to pick up one high school student, then maybe that's not efficient, effective. So one of the things I've advocated is that we do some type of specific busing survey will be and, and perhaps formulate a parent and transportation provider uh, team that would actually then analyze and, and, and how you would actually reinstate busing in a way that would be effective. So again, for those high school students, in some cases what they have they have their brothers being picked up and they can't get on the same bus and there's just some you know, prohibitions like that that really I think need to be revisited. But I think I think the district would benefit from a parent uh, or parents that have interest in this that would be willing to do a survey with the district to quantify how we would go about busing. And not next year, no, no. How about January? I know you made that suggestion in, uh, in July. Um, I don't want to wait a year. I mean, I've, I've heard from parents one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, we, we passed this levy. There is an expectation uh, that services are, are restored, especially what we had before we started making the cuts. So we we are thankfully com comfortable is not a good word, but we are far better off than what we were, you know, years ago, or even six months ago before the levy passed. I guess it's November, but um, anyhow, I know you're extremely busy. Uh, a mom of three, working full time, working on a PhD. Um, but you've obviously put a lot of legwork into this to come up with uh, a, a clear demonstration of, of community intent or, or interest in having the busing. So if you could coordinate with someone that would you know, perhaps be willing to work with the district, that's something I would be fully supportive of. I'm one person on the board, but we have to respond, in my opinion, to this board. We cannot continue to ignore this. It's a real need, and we need to do something. And we have the methodology, and I will be blunt, is unacceptable if the reason we say we aren't doing this is because we don't have bus drivers, because it's a very fair analysis that there is not even an advertisement for it. It's unacceptable. You identified this in July, and the district still has not even updated its own webpage for, uh, and I don't run the webpage right, it fixed it. Okay, so it, it needs to be dealt with. And so, um, Dr. Kozad, I need you to move forward on this. Look for bus drivers. Let's figure out a plan for how to define and make busing happen. But maybe it doesn't need to happen, right? That's where I'll give, I'll give a little out here. Let's define it. Let's study it. Let's survey it. Analyze it. And if it does, and I think it does, but let's just be fair here. Then back on it. Let's do it. 
and uh, we've got the money, and let's find a way to get find bus drivers. It's not that hard. So uh, let's do it. Amen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful job you've done putting this together. And it's my opinion that children need to do their job every day. And their job is going to school. And parents need to do their job every day. And their job is going to work. So we do, and we are committed to helping you in this. Thank you very much. Uh, Melanie Glover. I appreciate you, Dr. Kozad, and the school board for this opportunity to speak. My name is Melanie Glover. I'm a mother of a Belbrook graduate and another child in the Belbrook High School. I am also a physician in our community. I dedicated 16 years to higher education to develop my expertise as a medical doctor. I committed five years to undergraduate training and majored in both mathematics and biology I minored in chemistry. I completed four years of medical school, then a four-year residency in obstetrics and gynecology. This was followed by three years of subspecialty training in maternal fetal medicine. I have completed advanced studies fundamental to scientific research in clinical medicine. These include, but are not limited to, anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, cellular biology, virology, genetics, epidemiology, biochemistry, biostatistics, and medical ethics. I've been a physician for 18 years, all of those years in this community. My job is to manage vulnerable patient population and their medically complicated pregnancies. I consistently rely upon the best available evidence to treat my patients every day. And when I confront a clinical dilemma beyond my area of expertise, I consult other specialists. It is by virtue of these years of scientific study and daily experience, I am urging you to rely on the recommendations and consultation of those who have particular expertise to facilitate this decision of masking in our schools, our public health officials. These teams are comprised of physicians, sanitarians, technicians, engineers, nurses, epidemiologists, educators, and others who have unique training. They are trained to call the latest data and then translate that into public health by providing the most protection for the population with the least amount of burden for intervention. We have two pandemics, one with a virus, one with misinformation. I want my voice to be one of reassurance and encouragement to all of you. Many of us are experiencing negative stress emotions, such as fear, anger, depression, anxiety, and even despair. It is normal for people to transfer these negative stress emotions toward healthcare providers like myself and to school administrators such as yourselves. I am very empathetic to you all as leaders dealing with this difficult decision. This is so very, very hard. Please don't allow yourselves to lose sight of ultimately doing what is right. It is my understanding that we do not have any board members who are experts in public health, epidemiology, pediatrics, or infectious disease, or psychology, and that's okay, because there are organizations that do have significant expertise in all of these, specifically the CDC, the AAP, and ODH. They have made recommendations and public pleas and they are all aligned. Let your decisions be illuminated by the recommendations of experts in public health, 
pediatrics, psychology, and infectious disease, I implore you to support the evidence-based recommendations made by public health officials with regard to SARS-CoV-2 and the relevant variants. Please amend your COVID medication policy to require masking of students, volunteers, and staff while inside our district buildings. I'm confident that the future will bring better things for us as vaccinations become more available and we pass this Delta peak. Please, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glover. Good evening. My name is Dr. Meredith Brinegar. I'm here to address the psychological impact of wearing masks. Board members have expressed concern about this, and it may have influenced their mask policy. I'm equipped to speak on this as a clinical psychologist trained in social science. I've created a five-page document with citations that I have shared with you tonight. I will follow this up with an email because all of the citations are hyperlinked. Um, I'm going to just give you the highlights here um, since I am time limited. We know that youth mental health concerns have been rising for well over a decade. We also know that mental health symptoms have increased during the pandemic among all ages. What role, if any, do masks play? There was a significant increase in psychological symptoms from March to April 2020, long before children were wearing masks. This suggests that other factors were contributing. Variations in the rate of psychological symptoms since then seem to follow the general trend of cases and hospitalizations. So what other factors are contributing? Unemployment, financial strain, being around family 24-7, living alone, isolation from extended family, family members contracting or dying from COVID, racial disparities in healthcare, a prior history of psychological distress, limited access to mental health care and to virtual schooling. We are in the early days of understanding the ways each of these factors contribute. And it may be impossible to fully extricate the ways that these variables commingle. Is it possible that mask wearing could be included in this list of contributors? Yes. Is there a direct and singular link? No. The only research I found linking masks to social emotional well-being, and it was previously mentioned here, is the decreased ability to detect emotions, especially happiness and anger, because those involve the mouth more than the other basic emotions. The, uh, most of this research was conducted with adults, though the one study I found that looked at children showed the same effect of, of a decrement in detecting emotions, but the effect was not dramatic. Um, the good news, however, is that there's some work around. The first is that the mouth, while important, is only one source of input. We look to things like verbal content, intonation, and gestures. You've seen me gesturing, right? To help us understand how others are feeling. I can attest I wear a mask every day and do psychotherapy with it um, without uh, a judgment. The second workaround, which has experimental evidence, is the use of masks with transparent sections, making the mouth visible. Summary and recommendations. One, implement a mask mandate for at least K to six. This is not my ideal, but perhaps a compromise, as Mr. Price previously mentioned tonight. As a psychologist, I am alarmed that we are placing the burden of health decisions on our children. They are not developmentally equipped for this, especially in the lower grades. Mask mandates eliminate this burden and also eliminate the need to quarantine. Two, encourage use of masks with transparent midsections if needed. Three, be judicious about mask exemptions. Mask mandates don't work if everyone can opt out. Four, protecting public health 
is an issue of equity and inclusion, which was spoken about tonight during the strategic plan portion of the meeting. It is a privilege to say, my child, my toy. It devalues the ways the virus has devastated communities of color. It devalues special needs students who legitimately cannot wear masks. Some students with neurodevelopmental disorders, like Down syndrome, are also at a higher risk for COVID complications. Five, increase school-based mental health services. Some districts are using ARP funds for this purpose. Six, and last, teachers, staff, and board members should model, should model mask wearing and emphasize their benefits, even if the district continues with a, quote, strongly recommended policy and not a mandate. What message does it convey when leadership strongly recommends an action that they themselves don't follow? In the end, we want our students to continue with in-person learning as long as possible. Although there is little to no evidence that mask wearing has caused the rise in psychological symptoms, there is evidence that virtual and hybrid learning has. Masks keep kids in school, which is at the heart of the AAP's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rivera. Aaron Friel. Hello. Um, while I 100% support those who are here to advocate for universal indoor masking um, until a vaccine is available, I'm actually here to speak on what I perceive as a lack of transparency and planning on the part of the school board and administration. I found the emails and phone calls tend to largely go unanswered, and when returned, they're often peppered with non-answers. So here are some of my specific concerns. Um, as Mr. Price mentioned before, uh, the COVID-19 dashboard should be updated on a daily basis, and additionally, it should be broken out by grade. This board, excuse me, has made the decision that we are all responsible for our own family's health decisions and place that over public health. And if that's to be the case, we as parents need real-time data to make these decisions. I've reached out to school staff who reported that they were not allowed to disclose these numbers to me. And I would not have known about several new quarantines and positive cases at BCI, my daughter's school, yesterday if it weren't for parents posting on the Parent Citizen Discussion Board. This is not an appropriate way for information to be disseminated. I have unanswered questions regarding modified quarantines. If it's determined that a child should be on a modified quarantine, who is making sure that that child is indeed wearing their mask per the ODH guidelines for quarantining? Please tell me that it is someone other than the child who should be responsible for this and someone other than the parent who is not there. If the district is, is the district, I'm sorry, sure that they are following the ODH guidelines on this. While I'm on the topic of quarantining, I would also submit to you that it does not seem appropriate to me that our youngest children are, quote, in the best position to know their masking status on a day-to-day -day basis for the purposes of quarantining, as stated in the Safe Return to School Plan. How can anyone think it's appropriate or reliable for elementary age children? By the way, universal indoor masking would alleviate this. Furthermore, it's unclear to the community who's responsible for even making these decisions. Who has the power to mandate masks? Who decides when we go to hybrid? Sorry, I'm nervous and my voice is doing weird things. <laughs> who decides how social distancing works at lunch? And who decides who's responsible for overseeing quarantines and modified quarantines? Many of my frustrations could have easily been avoided if the safe return to school plan accounted for situations that could have been anticipated easily. The dashboard should have been up and running on day one. A plan to mitigate the spread at lunch should have been developed, communicated, and rolled out on day one. A plan to track who is wearing a mask for the purposes of implementing quarantine and modified quarantines should have been in place on day one. Contingency plans for a pivot to a mask mandate or hybrid learning should have been developed and communicated by day one. I can appreciate how difficult this all is, but respectfully, this is not March 2020. There should have been a well-communicated plan in place for all of this. 
I do want to end on a positive note. Um, I have had some good experiences with BCI. Uh, Mr. Phillips has communicated in a timely and forthright manner, answering my questions as best he can. The teachers there are largely masked up, and I can only speak for myself, um, communicating openly. And I don't think anyone is working harder than Mrs. Is it Malice? Malice, I'm sorry. Malice. The school nurse. So let's get the lunch situation figured out quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah Williamson. All right. This is a pretty rough time for Bellbrook. I think we've had a few of those lately. So I know everybody has a lot of concerns, and I'm sure all of you guys are up to date on all the pandemic information. We're currently, I believe, the last district in the area to mandate masks. Um, cases in Green County are up fivefold in the last 30 days, and the numerous quarantines are resulting in disruptions to the community. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to raise concerns about the transparency being demonstrated with the community in general. And I think we deserve to know how your decisions are made. I don't mean your disjointed individual thoughts. I mean that your official board positions should be justifiable. And you've all received very clear, reasonable questions about your positions, but I haven't seen many clear answers. And while I do hear you, and I appreciate the care that you took for your answers, there is no content or actual information being communicated. It's clear that some of you are doing your own research. So let's see it. I would like to see the information that you're using. Are public health decisions being based on popularity or number of emails? What? I would like to, you to share your custom analysis that you've done um, so we can see what's actually going on. Regardless of how you feel about masking, I think we all deserve to know which metrics you're using, if any. It's no secret, obviously, by now that I disagree with your anti-mask approach. But if you're going to call it parent's choice, then it should actually be a parent's choice. Did you survey parents? Do parents even know they have to communicate their choice directly with their teacher? But only if they want their kid to wear a mask. Is the teacher allowed to ask the student to put their mask back on? Because from what I've heard, that's not the case. So you expect five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds to do that on their own. It clearly sounds like that that's the case. And that's not really parents' choice. It sounds like the only parents that are getting a choice are the ones that are not wearing a mask. And since we're not exercising universal masking, the quarantine flowchart indicates each unmasked and unvaccinated contact will be sent home for seven to 10 days. For a kindergartner, that's 110 minutes of STEM, 60 minutes in the library, 120 minutes in the gym and the music room, 450 minutes of recess, 300 minutes of computer time, 2,400 minutes of instruction, and 3,600 minutes of socialization. This is what parents are choosing, so it's important that these choices are respected. It's worth looking at the other half of the flowchart. If you're taking universal precautions, then we just remain in the normal in-person classroom setting after exposure to a positive case. The board does have a masking policy, which was already mentioned, which is 8450 which states that the responsibility of the board and the superintendent to mandate masks for students and staff, respectively. It also references a pandemic plan developed by the district's pandemic response team under policy 8420, which is a policy that doesn't exist. So this seems like an important policy to be missing right now. I know it's a lot, but it's worth just taking a breath and looking around and knowing that this play will end someday. And when it does, we're all still going to be neighbors regardless of which side of this particular discussion you were on. I believe that we all honestly want to do what's right by our kids and that we can see we share those fundamental values. While there are disagreements on how to fix this issue, the broader issue of transparency has been ignored for too long. Board decisions appear to just be debated in secret, with unknown motivation or information, and the community is just an afterthought. I'd like you to please start to use your actions to show that you hear us and not just your words. Thank you.
Don Holding for mental health. Some extra copies, so I'm like, ah, I can eat it. But I still have enough to read. And it has a picture, so that makes it more fun. Thank you. You'll find that on every box of masks, by the way. Okay, let me put my cheaters on. First and foremost, my name is Dawn Holding. I'm a CPA, I'm a mom of two, a Bellbrook graduate and currently a freshman. I'm a mom of a vaccine injured child whose treatment was $8,000 a month for four years after he was injured. Whew, that was a hard one to think. I'm immunocompromised, I'm a kidney failure, I need a kidney. Blood types available after the year if you guys want to donate. Uh, I'm a COVID survivor, I'm a FDA's poster child of fear. Like I should be so scared right now, okay? I have every single thing wrong with me and my family that I should be concerned. But most of all, I'm a concerned parent of Bellbrook schools. For every study that shows mask effectiveness, I can show you one that isn't. All these people quoted all these great studies. I'm sure, they did a great job. Guess what? I have my own study at home. I have my own subject at home. I don't need to rely on studies. I care how it affects my child, how my friends tell me their children hurt with this topic. That's what I care about. Show me your statistics. Show me that. It means nothing to me as a parent. That being said, to argue the science that makes masks promote well-being is insane. From just common sense. My God, these kids wear their masks to the bathroom, wipe their nose on them, drop them in the floor, keep them in the bottom of their book bags, spill God knows what on them. And yet we say this is a clean method for germ spreading. There are bacteria growing on these masks that now can be inhaled all day, shared with their friends, moved around, and make it even worse. The more things we have on here, as a matter of fact, those of you speaking with masks touch your face at least 13 to 25 times. Last year, both of my children, senior and eighth grader at the time, complained of endless migraine headaches, bloody noses, how much they can get school. Masks made them miss interacting with their friends and their teachers at school. They ever, my daughter told me, I didn't even know what my teacher's face looked like to the last day of school, mom. How horrible. How mentally impacting is that to a child? I can't imagine you people who want to freaking mask a kid who's kindergarten and sixth grade. They need to see people smile. They need to feel love. This is a mental <laughs> And the largest criminal fine in history. 
industry was paid by Pfizer for $2.3 billion for putting out a drug they knew would kill people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Turner. Wait for the microphone down, even though this is a aerosolized uh, respiratory virus, you can catch it from it. Uh, Why let science get away of here? I can't believe I have to follow her. Um, my, name, my name is Rob Turner. I, I reside in Bellbrook with my wife and two uh, twin sons that go to uh, Stephen Bell. I'm here to voice my concerns of, that I have over any COVID-19 requirements of a medical device that would potentially interfere with my God-given right as a parent. Um, I'm not a medical practitioner, clinician, or other medically trained person, nor am I a legal expert. I am, however, a reasonably educated businessman that, with a hard-earned um, common sense. <laughs> I will start by saying that we are in an unprecedented time. We have a very serious disease that has uh, fundamentally altered society on the entire planet. Uh, it's a disease that not only is responsible for illness and death, but uh, an increase in hopelessness, despair, joblessness, uh, drug and alcohol dependency, suicides, and destroyed economies, just to name a few. It is also responsible for the greatest restriction in human rights on record, including what seems to be a wholesale disbanding of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in preparation for my, uh, my statement today, uh, the core of my research proved beyond a reasonable doubt in my head um, that A, uh, masks are ineffective. Uh, there have been hundreds of studies uh, 75 years prior to COVID, prior to the politicization, um, and not a single one of them found that uh, masks stop viruses. They stop bacteria, they stop spittle, but they don't stop viruses. Um, and I would be pro-mask if they did, if any of them did, even one. Um, but the, the part of the evidence in those studies did show that the cloth masks actually increased the um, influence of linked illnesses because of the bacteria that they maintain. Dr. Fauci and his, uh, the, the great Dr. Fauci and his uh, National Institute of Health studied pandemics and epidemics and concluded on the, of the 1918 pandemic that the vast majority of influenza deaths resulted from secondary bacterial pneumonia as a direct result of mask wearing and mask mandates. If you remember, those were masks that people were using to protect themselves, not to protect everybody else. Um, additionally, the uh, uh, metadata, st metadata study uh, performed by the CDC uh, last summer indicated that there was no reduction in viral transmission with the use of face masks. And in, ca in fact, in some cases, it actually increased because people were touching their masks, like everybody here has been doing. Um, the other thing that I discovered in the in the uh, research was the Supreme Wall of this land, as described in both the United States and the Ohio Constitution, support individual liberty in each and every decision made on masking. That is the United States Constitution, not the ODH. Uh, ultimately, the ODH will be overturned as, as their statements or their uh, their orders are uh, unconstitutional. Uh, but none of this matters uh, to anyone because what I'm talking about today is really. Uh, uh, it's an, actually an argument of a belief system, not the facts. Uh, all that matters is the children. Uh, so let's discuss the children quickly. Uh, the children have been repeatedly shown not to be drivers of this contagion. It is well accepted that children have a statistically zero chance of, of, of dying from COVID. Uh, the CDC currently is showing that the K through 12 mortality rate from COVID is 0 .00003. That's four zeros. Um, there's probably more children that die from falls on the playground to state earlier uh, uh, discussion. Um, case count is a silly way to look at this. It really is a silly way to look at it. Look at uh, look at uh, the symptomatic children. Look at uh, hospitalizations. Look at death, but don't look at case count because they're, it, it's just irrational with with the fact that they are almost always asymptomatic. I need to just start finishing. Up. Yep. Yep. Um, as, an, as an intervention, specifically one that's prophylactic, uh, most, uh, it must cause fewer harm, less harm than it does, uh, or uh, less harm than it does harm to the person uh, with the infection. And masks are, uh, are act, they absolutely are hurting children uh, psychologically, mentally. Uh, and children of my kids' age, they, they need to see the teacher's mouth. They need to see uh, the students that they're talking to. 
Um, I will I will close by saying that you can mask your children if you desire. I have no problems with masks. Um, I, I, I think it's child abuse in my perspective, my thought, uh, but I never ask you to change the oil in your car so my engine doesn't blow up. If you want to mask your children, that's fine, but don't don't impact mine to save yours. It doesn't make any sense. And that, thank you. Children died of COVID-19 in the first year. In the prior couple of years from influenza, only 250 children died. So these facts were wrong. Okay, thank you very much. But let's not let's not get into the debate um, in, the, in the group. Thank you. Terry Blanken. To see you on busing. Terry Blanken. I'm sorry I did not anticipate a crowd such as this or I would have had a statement typed up. Instead I have some notes. Uh, it isn't just about busing and I'm not going to talk. Can you hear me? I'm not going to talk about COVID for a moment. Um, we live in Sugar Creek, my husband and I. Uh, I'm a retired teacher. I've been involved all along with my children's, three children's education. Now I have a grandson in the district who's in high school. I've been involved all along with him. My concern is, uh, throw tomatoes at me, I was not in favor of passing this levy. Um, I have some very good reasons for that, 32 years of being asked to spend money in the very last second. Because if we didn't spend it and it was in the budget, it was going to be lost. So it was spent on ridiculous, idiotic things. Um, what I don't understand is the programs that were systematically removed because we did not have money as a district and we weren't passing the levy, they've not been put back in. I, I can't say exactly which ones, but many of them. In particular, busing. Um, I don't appreciate being a grandparent who's retired and yet I cannot travel because I must transport my grandson so that his mother can go to work every day. So I'm still tied here. I've raised my children, I've raised my grandson, and I don't understand how you can come to the public and say, we must pass this letter, okay? And then I find out, I, I may be off, but I found out on the community sheet that by 2025, you anticipate having a surplus of $11.7 million. I mean, that's what I read. And when I responded to the person who put that in there, they said, well, that's because the cost of things go up. But the amount of money we have in this levy remains the same. And I said, buddy, you should say that. Because the cost of things are going up for my home and my family also. My income is remaining the same also. State teachers, we haven't had a raise in years and years. I don't anticipate any more raises. Okay? So I don't know why you would sell this levy that was so huge, saying, we, all right, we're going to have to get rid of us in that. All right, we're going to have to get rid of STEM. We're going to have to get rid of this. We're going to cut this. We're going to cut that. And did you put it back in when you passed the levy? No, you did not. And that's all I had to share. Okay. Thank you very much. Mark Kipling. Good evening. Good evening. I, I last spoke with you two weeks ago regarding how contagious the COVID-19 Delta variant is and how masking does more to protect people around the masked individual than it does for themselves. The day after I spoke, my oldest son started showing symptoms and was confirmed positive for COVID-19 on that Saturday. Our youngest son then tested positive three days later despite our best efforts to keep that from happening. 
I can give you my story about everything we've dealt with, and I'm still dealing with now that this has happened, but that is only one story. That's anecdotal data. Trying to argue one story against another story is only going to leave everyone frustrated and angry. Policy decisions concerning communicable disease cannot be based on anecdotal data. In the past two weeks, the Ohio ICU hospital utilization for COVID-19 has gone from 7.3% to 12.9%. Green County has gone from 350 cases per 100,000 residents to 590. In the two weeks before the last meeting, we were at 150 cases per 100,000. In a month, the density of cases has quadrupled within our uh, county population. Last year, VSS went to a hybrid learning schedule around 570 cases per 100K. I had intention of presenting additional data tonight. However, there's still a significant amount of reporting that lags by several weeks in some cases. The number of cases reported by child care uh, lags by uh, like two weeks. Our sons have been infected, gone through the infectious period, and were returned to school before they show up in that system. The reporting system for individual hospital utilization also lags by that amount. So if you're trying to make a determination on that data, you're well behind the curve. We have made a request for the chief medical officer for our children's pediatrician to send you documentation regarding the increased number of cases they're seeing in their offices. One justification I've made against masking is the students' parents have had ample opportunity to get a vaccination if they desired. There are still other adults who are immunocompromised. My nephew was born with a heart defect and will likely need to be put on a heart or liver transplant list in the next 10, 15 years. If you were to suffer any lung damage, you would no longer be eligible for those lists. A friend of our family's father is currently battling cancer and had received the vaccine, but his immune system was too weak for his attention. Centerville, Springboro, Beaver Creek, Fairborn, Kettering, and Senior have gone or will be going to some level of mask mandating or mandated masking. We are not a school system of multiple schools covering the same grade. We send all school students of a certain grade into the same building. If it spreads within one building, it will spread throughout the community. Uh, if you're waiting on the Green County Public Health Department to change their stance on masking, to mandate or demand that they masking, they cannot do anything more than strongly recommend masking. Senate Bill 22 stripped them of any capability of doing anything other than placing requirements on the sick and people that the sick person is likely exposed. If you feel like enforcing health guidelines on the student population isn't part of your job, well, the Ohio legislature decided otherwise. Le legislature uh, decided otherwise. I'm certainly for in-class learning, and I'm not requesting mandating masking forever, but only until the parents who would like a child to be vaccinated are given the ability to do so. Thank you very much. Is it Decina, Decina Gaines? Is that pronounced correctly? Thank you. I apologize. I'm slow. That's quite all right. Um, did I pronounce your name correctly? You did. It's oh, all right. So thank you. I've never been to a meeting before, but I was um, asked to come in and speak tonight. So I don't come here just as a parent. I come here as someone who has spent 10 years in a career of clinical research. 10 years of doing clinical trials, starting out with vaccine research, going to adult psychiatric and addiction research, back to pediatrics, into infectious disease and GI research. So every three quarters of my career I spent in the pediatric field. I've done over 75 clinical trials. I was not just a research nurse. I was also a self-investigator, so I have been credited on publications that have been out there. I believe in science, I believe in data. Science is never settled. Um, I hold a degree in nursing. I hold a degree in applied and technical studies. I have taken multiple statistics, biology, chemistry, A and P, and I was also certified by the ARCP, which is the most prestigious um, certifying agency in the research community one of the only few people in Dayton that holds that certification. Um, I worked with one of the doctors at Children's who is our top infectious disease specialist and I coordinated all of his infectious disease research. And I stand here today also as a parent of four, one who of which has been injured by vaccines confirmed by genetics and I myself was a researcher. 
I also stand here. As you noticed, I walked out very slow. I have a rare form of muscular dystrophy. I am one of two genetically diagnosed in the state of Ohio. My right jugular is blocked 98%. The only blood flow I have through there is currently with the port. They cannot go in and remove the clot as my clot sits on the base of my skull. It's too difficult to go in and operate. I have also had health syndrome times two. This occurs in less than 1% of all pregnancies. I am the poster child for if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. My doctors know this, they see my face. I should have a mask on, according to people who believe in masks, who believe what they want to believe, but I make a choice not to wear a mask. I should fear the flu, I should fear strep, I should fear anything and everything that is out there, but I don't. I choose to wash my hands, I choose to stay healthy, I choose to follow my physician's orders. We have never masked our kids for flu. We have never masked our kids for RSV. And I've worked in children's hospitals, on the ICU floors, on the regular floors, and all of them. I stand to support the Nuremberg Code, as we have done the Tuskegee experiment on our own people. I believe in informed consent. And as of right now, our children cannot consent. Consent is important. And I do not consent for my child to be masked or any of my children to be masked. If you wish to mask your child, then so be it. Regarding Ms. Presnell's words about controlling your own policy here within the board, I think you guys are doing a great job. The Ohio Revised Code allows three exemptions for vaccination, which parents are allowed to utilize. In doing so, we acknowledge that if there is a breakout, we will quarantine our children at home. It's exactly what your policy states. Now, research recently published in JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association, um, shows that masks work. They work to increase the inhaled CO2 levels in the children beyond acceptable safety levels after only three minutes of wearing. Three. Think about an entire school day. I can provide you with the figure and the, and the data, but what it boils down to is the youngest child had the highest values with one seven-year-old child's carbon dioxide level measured at 25,000 parts per minute. I have a child who will soon be seven, and this I deem unacceptable. The US EPA safe standards for carbon dioxide is less than 5,000 parts per million. So let's go back and review. That is five times what is allowed by our EPA that our children are inhaling within five minutes, or three minutes. Um, as of Monday, Children's in Dayton was full with beds open. Our news is reporting how our hospital is full. It is full with RSV and two positive cases of COVID. We're not denying that it is there, but it is all right. Um, there's no one size fits all when it comes to medicine, just as you know, and there's no one size fits all when it comes to how our children learn. My child is learning disabled, she requires face and has um, speech delays, receptive and expressive delays, it is very important for her to have face-to-face -face with people. And last year she regressed being forced to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I will not force my child to wear a mask to come to school. Amen. Thank you. Thank Yeah, she, she we're not, we're not gonna, we're, everybody's going to get their opportunity to speak. We're, we're signed up, so thank you very much. But we're not going to, we're not going to go into chaos. Christina Pavlik. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A little closer. A little closer. Yeah. I'm tall. I'm tall. <laughs> uh, I apologize. I don't feel like I'll make them. That's right. That's quite right. Um, so last evening I sent each of the board members um, some data, and I just wanted to share that here um, in this comment period. So in order to ensure that you have the information necessary to make knowledgeable database decisions about the school year, 
I want to provide the status of COVID-19 in Green County and our school district. Yeah, I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I can't hear you. Do I need it like crowded like this? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, you each have the email. I, I again, I apologize if I printed copies, but um, so there's some key metrics that we can look at to determine uh, the state of COVID in our community. Those include confirmed illness and quarantine of staff and students, cases, hospitalizations, deaths, hospitalization rate, um, and death rate. There are some limitations to the data that is available on the Ohio website for COVID-19. Um, one of those limitations is the breakdown of the age groups. Uh, the youngest group is 0 to 19, so there is not a delineation between eligible for vaccine and not. Um, I cited three different sources, and none of them use the same age range or date range, for that matter. So, um, but there is some correlation that can be made. Those sources are um, the Ohio Court Coronavirus website, Ohio Hospital Association website, and our BSS website. Um, some of this is redundant to what Doug presented, or Dr. Pozet presented, um, about our current state of cases and quarantines. As of now, or as of the week ending 822, there were four COVID positive cases in our buildings. Each of those resulted in an average of about 12 individuals being quarantined, or a total of 49 last week. Um, the next piece on the paper that I did not bring to print, um, sorry about that, um, was a graph depicting the cases, hospitalizations, and death count uh, by week for the entire year of 2021. Uh, with the death, and, I'm sorry, with the hospitalization rate over, overlaid on top. So for um, July of 2021, ages 0 to 9 in Greene County, there were 62 total cases, zero hospitalizations, and zero deaths. So far in August, we're up to 332 cases, one hospitalization, and still at zero deaths. So that hospitalization rate, while our cases are dramatically going up, that is something we can all acknowledge. Um, the hospitalization rate currently for that age group is 0.3%. Um, for the entire year of 2021, we're at 1,437 cases, 10 hospitalizations, at a rate of 0.7%. Final piece that I called out to you as a board was the Ohio Hospitalization COVID Dashboard. I'm sorry, Ohio Hospital Association COVID dashboard. And if we, um, if anyone wants to have that link, I can share it with you. It is in the document I provided to you. Um, we are in region three. And as of the week of 816 to 822, in region three, there were two hospitalizations total for ages zero to 17 in our region. And that includes, I think, about five or six counties. Mm -hmm. So uh, just those two total out of the entire region. And I believe that is all the data I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope I may, I'd like to thank you, Mrs. Pavlik, for presenting those numbers. Uh, in the interest of transparency and letting you know just some of the tools, you know, while we're working through this weighty topic, um, Mrs. Pavlik has presented numbers in the past, you know, with some charts and some graphs. Um, it's been extremely helpful to see that data, and I've noticed every report that you give to us is free of bias, it is free of recommendations, it's just the numbers. Um, so I, I would like to recommend to the board that I think it would be extremely helpful for me, I think it would be helpful for the board um, to have a regular report at each meeting. Here in person, maybe we can get some of the graphs that uh, you compile that way the, the community can benefit from seeing those numbers. I know Mrs. Pavlik has agreed to donate her time and expertise, and in addition to an in-person report that we can all see, um, also getting a, a weekly report just electronically, just as an FYI uh, to each board member. Uh, but Mrs. Pavlik currently works in the data analytics space in a medical insurance organization. She and her team complete data analytics for multiple product lines in five different states. 
She has more than 10 years of operations management experience and has held data analyst positions within her company for the past four years. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for, for your time and expertise. Thank you. We'll go on to our next person to speak, uh, Molly DeWeese. Molly, there you go. My name is Molly Deweese, and I have four children in the district, all at different schools, all in a different building. Oh. High school, now student book. You got it all. I do. I run the gamut. So um, I have a question for the board, and my purpose is not to get into a debate um, about rights or anything like that, but rather to look at your thought process on why you made the decision that you made. So last year, when the virus seemed to be carried, but not directly impacting your students, they were required to wear a mask to protect the staff and administration, who at that time would be severely affected by the COVID virus, because at that time, they could not receive the vaccine because it wasn't available. But this year, when the tables are turned, and the virus can be carried uh, by your vaccinated staff and administration and by other adults that are coming into the building, to our vulnerable K through five students, who cannot at this time receive the vaccination, masks, masks are deemed optional. And this seems inconsistent with last year. So I'm worried for the safety of our students and I'm worried for the safety of all children. And I'm also worried about, um, I have a special needs daughter and she has compromised immune system. I'm worried for her. Um, I'm worried about a virtual system or a homeschool situation that could come from this in which my daughter will falter. She can't be in that environment without instruction from her teachers and from her um, special needs uh, uh, teachers. And I would rather my children be in school and in a mask rather than quarantined or made to go virtual because of a situation that may get out of hand. Thank you very much. Uh, Denise Moore with Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, reasonably well. Okay. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to address you again. Uh, my name is Denise Moore. I'm the founder, uh, a founder of Sugar Creek Cares. I addressed this board a couple of months ago and expressed the hope that the board would accelerate actions related to adopting a formal DEI plan, tied to the school strategic plan. Commend the work of uh, the school staff members that are they're doing right now to move this initiative forward. Great job to Betsy and your team. Nice job. <clears throat> um, I was hopeful that the board would uh, provide maximum support for this initiative. I emailed you, Mr. Carpenter, mm -hmm. and I asked you about the process for more board discussion regarding DEI, uh, the plan, and with public input. <clears throat> and I didn't get an answer about that. Um, I hope that you'll be able to answer that question tonight. I don't understand how the board makes decisions without having discussion. And, uh, and, at, and at what point do you have discussion so that people can provide input. Um, I appreciate that the board cannot talk among itself without a public meeting uh, because of sunshine laws. Mm -hmm. I believe today, considering the current social climate, the board would have set up a time to have discussion about DEI. As you know, Sugar Creek here is ready, willing, and able mm -hmm. to help. Um, 
we have a team ready to go to, to participate. And they're, they're actually already helping with some stuff. Um, so I'm hoping that, that we, you can move forward with the DEI plan and, and support, offer some good, strong support for that. Now, while I'm here, I just want to share why this is so, uh, why this initiative is so um, important to me. I am, I'm a gay woman. Um, and during my adolescence, I struggled badly with that. I believe I was alone. I, that's how I believed. I was alone in my school, my church. I believed I was a bad person. I often did not feel included. In fact, often I felt excluded. Um, these feelings were my feelings. They came from within me. That it was just the way I felt. I recognize times have changed now. And maybe it's easier for kids growing up that might be gay. Maybe not. Uh, one advantage I had, and, and this is in reference to diversity, one advantage I had was I was not, I did not have to wear my difference on my skin like people of color do. I did not come from a history of slavery. And I did not have to face the inequities that people of color have faced for many years, their entire lifetime. As I grew up, I did and still do sometimes overhear snide comments. Sometimes my spouse and I will walk into a party, a room full of people. People will notice us and whisper, here's the gay girls. Um, so actually, I started walking into party and saying, there's the straight people. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't really do that. <laughs> um, if, we were, um, if we were out dancing at a club, this was when I was much younger. I don't do that now. Um, the security officer would walk us to our cars to make sure no one was in way to do us harm. Mm -hmm. Because that does happen. It, it, it still happens. People still get shot from walking out of the gay club. I have to admit, my career as a college professor was fantastic. I was well respected, and I performed many important leadership functions and responsibilities for my college. My gayness was not an issue in my entire career. But in my youth, it was a struggle. So much so, I considered suicide. When George Floyd was murdered, that was a trigger for me. I decided to stand against racism and discrimination and the social injustices that minorities and people of color face every day in their lives. I do regret it that it took me so long to stand tall and and be willing to stand up for it. I hope that we can all work together to make our community more inclusive, more equitable, and socially more just. It should start with our school. Our students need us to act. So how does the board plan to move forward with your support of the school's DEI initiative? Thank you. have a, another name without a last name. Um, so someone named Jake, who lives in America. <laughs> I'm assuming you are in our community, sir. Yeah, I've got four kids. In okay, school. great. Thank you, sir. So I'll be rather brief. So as you heard me say, I've got four kids in the, in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, two seniors fourth grader and first grader. I wanted to ask, what's the most common cause of a fatal outcome to a, to a viral infection? Anybody on the board know? No? Okay. Development of a bacterial infection. That's the most common cause of a fatal outcome. Secondly, the second week of a viral infection is commonly understood to be the worry week. 
because that is when the body is most susceptible to developing a bacterial infection due to the natural balancing act the body plays and a lowered immune response from fighting off the virus. Other causes, causes of a weakened immune system, aging, diabetes, obesity, liver disease, kidney disease, cancer, lung disease, other infections, viral, bacterial, fungal stress, capital letters, stress, circulatory problems, cardiovascular disease, and several others all cause weakened immune systems. That's why they're called comorbidities. Stress is a big one and probably the biggest one for me. Just think about the added stress that is being put on our children by simply mandating they wear a mask or else. Not to mention everything else already on their tiny little plates. That reason in and of itself tells me that my child's health and wellness is not a priority when it comes to this matter. So besides all that, science does not support the theory that wearing any kind of face covering prevents or significantly decreases the spread of or contraction of a viral contagion. On top of that, you need my parental consent to administer any kind of medical treatment to my children or mandate they use any kind of medical device, which according to section 201 subsection H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines a mask for this purpose as just that, a medical device. Instead of taking part in the blatant and deplorable medical tyranny that is sweeping our great nation right now, maybe you should take some of that levy money you're receiving and take actions that could actually make a difference, like perhaps upgrading the HVAC systems to improve the air our kids are breathing, or something as simple as promoting good hygiene, healthy eating, and regular exercise. That would actually make a difference. In America, a mask should not be a child's passport to access public schools. I implore that you all join We the People and take a stand with us against this tyrannical government overreach, which is the real pandemic we're facing. Thank you. Amanda Gooden. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Hood, and um, I wanted to first thank all of you for currently supporting medical freedom and trusting our parents as the experts of our own children. Um, I really appreciate all of you doing that. Um, I want to talk about transparency. Um, I know that there's been some other conversations about transparency. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so I just wanted to read you all something on my phone. Okay, so, okay, on July 30th, 2019, I typed on Facebook, I just had a wonderful phone call this morning with Dr. Koza, the Bellbrook superintendent, about the language in emails regarding vaccinations being required to attend public schools. This is not a vaccine debate. Although I am an advocate for medical freedom strongly, I do not want to debate vaccines with anyone. I am an advocate for parent choice, and I don't believe ever in telling anyone how to parent their child. I could care less if anyone vaccinates their kid and I don't want them to try and push me to vaccinate mine or mask my child. Okay, um, this phone call concentrated on the law and how in our state we have medical freedom. We are blessed to live in one of 16 states in this great nation that allows for all three exemptions, reasons of conscience or philosophical, as well as religious and medical exemptions. And that should be told, celebrated, and transparently put out there for our parents to know every single time that we say that vaccines are required for public schools because technically they're not. Okay. We can choose to waive any or all vaccines and still attend public schools. I sent Dr. Kozad over the revised, the Ohio Revised Code, section 3313.671 as well as forwarded them emails sent to me with illegal language from our school district. Not only was he incredibly receptive and wonderful, he guaranteed that they will make it right. So 
so that parents know that they always have a choice. That is not what happened. <laughs> because I am still receiving emails from just recently Mr. Hahn at the high school that stated that the meningitis vaccine was required for my son's attendance and other high school seniors. That is a lie. That is not required. We have not vaccinated our children in 13 years, and we don't plan on vaccinating them ever again. We already went down that road, and we won't do it again, and that is our choice, and we can still send our kids to public schools. You should be making parents aware of these exemptions every single time an email is sent to our parents in this community. They should know that they have a choice, always. In addition to that, we should stop um, making it seem like parents don't have choices as far as like um, testing your kids for COVID. I'm not going to tell a parent that, oh, you shouldn't test your kid for COVID. Some parents really want to know, does my kid have it, does, do they not? But we don't have to run out and PCR test our kids. We now have access to antigen tests. And you can buy them at Walgreens or Drug Mart. You can buy them online. You can even get them at the local libraries for free. And you can test your child from the privacy of your own home. I'm also saying this would prevent some quarantines here. Um, that should also be made known to our parents. Um, additionally, I think that you should allow for proof of a positive antibodies test in order for these kids to be allowed to go back to school. And I also think that you should allow for a negative COVID test. I mean, what in the world? I could take my child to Greece or Italy tomorrow on a plane with a negative COVID test, but you won't let him in school? My healthy child is quarantined right now. Why? Why? It's so foolish. I could take him across the country. These are, these are good tests. They have a relatively high um, efficacy. They are good enough for the NFL. They're good enough for Hollywood stars to get on set every single day. These are the tests that they're using. So they should be good enough for our children to have an education. Um, maybe I'll start closing up. Okay. Um, additionally, I just wanted to um, let you know real quick because Dr. Kozak, you did mention this just a little bit ago in regards to House Bill 244. You said, I don't think that that affects the school district. Um, it actually does. Um, under the Ohio Legislative, Legislative Service Commission, HB 244 of the 134th General Assembly, which does go into law on October 13th, says public schools and higher education institutions prohibits a public school or state institution of higher education from doing either of the following. Number one, requiring an individual to receive a vaccine that is not yet fully approved by the Food and Drug Administration, which it is not, please research that. Number two, discriminating against an individual who has not received that vaccine, including by requiring the individual to engage in or refrain from engaging in any activities or precautions that differ from the activities or precautions of an individual who has received such vaccine. Thank you very much. Turn the camera. Well, I'll try to make it short. Um, I, my name is Julie Cameron. I have one child in the Buffalo High School. I graduated three students um, in the early 2000s. Um, what I'm writing about is what has been occurring at the high school. I sent this email to each and every one of the board members early this morning, so I don't know whether or not you received it, so I thought I would just go ahead and read it. Um, first of all, just wanting to thank you for your hard work and effort. I'm trying to con concise it here. Um, uh, okay. I am writing to con convey some disturbing situations that have occurred in both the high school and at Bell Creek Intermediary. Intermediate. They may have occurred at the other schools, however, I will only speak with certainty about the two schools that I have accurate witness accounts. In the high school, on the first day, some students were, one, showing a video explaining why they should get the COVID-19 shot. 
a freshman student was told by a history teacher he needed to get his facts so that, quote, he didn't ever have to quarantine. Another mother shared that all of her children's classes discussed COVID guidelines um, during part of the time. One of them, in particular, a teacher spent a significant amount of time discussing and telling the kids how strongly they, the teacher, recommended masking. A mother shared that her fourth grade student was read a book about, quote, germs in the air, and then the class was told that they should get the COVID-19 shot, a fourth grade class. These actions mentioned above unequivocally go against the parent choice model set forth by the BFS board. A teacher is defined as a person with the accurate and specific ability, intuition, education, experience, skills, knowledge, and qualifications to teach a specific subject or number of subjects. Nowhere in this definition or in our common health set of convictions or beliefs are teachers described as healthcare providers, medical doctors, and most importantly, teachers are not the parents of our students. No teacher has the medical expertise to push their agenda on any student within the school system. This practice is unethical, immoral, and wrong. It must be stopped now. Future violations of parent choice by teachers should be met with disciplinary actions. All BSS teachers have signed a contract to teach their subject of expertise. For example, reading, writing, math, history. I can almost guarantee you there is not a general clause in their contract that permits them to teach their political, religious, or medical ideology. If students know a teacher's political ideology, those teachers have failed in fulfilling their duties. Teachers are to follow critical thinking skills in students. Teaching critical thinking skills, not critical race theory, allows students to be able to assess situations and make decisions based on their moral and religious values that are taught and fostered at home by their parents. This practice must be stopped as it undermines each and every parent's morals, values, and absolute authority to raise their children according to their God-given rights. Thank you. Tammy Gaines. Dan or Dunn? It's Dan. Dan, okay. Um, so my name is Dr. Tammy Dan. I sent you guys an email earlier this week, I believe. Um, I went back and forth whether or not I was going to come and kind of share with the community what I had shared with you guys. Um, just so everyone knows, I am a physician. Um, I practice anesthesia critical care as well as pain management. I also have a master's in public health and maternal and child health from the University of Minnesota. So I am not here to say that you know we need to mask, we don't need to mask to go back and forth. I'm just here to say I practice evidence-based medicine in my clinic right now, and we need to practice kind of evidence-based for this. I know we have guidelines, we have recommendations, we have everybody kind of giving us their opinions and their anecdotes, but what it comes down to is there are really three websites probably that we need to be checking regularly for 
what data we're going to look at. So it's already been mentioned, the Ohio Hospital Association, you know, they, like we said before, there's two pediatric cases of COVID that are admitted right now. So we need to keep an eye on that. We need to look and see what's happening in the hospital system because the kids are going to spread this. It's not if you get COVID, it's when you get COVID at this point. It is ubiquitous in the communities. You're either going to get it and be vaccinated or you're going to get it and not be vaccinated is what we're coming down to. This is spreading like wildfire. And the plus side is that if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics COVID cases and children report, and they also update that on a regular basis, that only 0.2 to 1.9% of all child COVID cases result in a hospitalization. For comparison's sake, if you look at our last flu season that we had in 2018-19, 4.3 to 5.2% of all of those cases of children were hospitalized. They also track on there as well that there are from 0 to 0.03% of all of those cases of childhood COVID, that's what cases result in death. So if you go back and look at the data for flu, it's actually comparable to that. Flu actually is a lot worse. I've taken care of kids in the pediatric ICU as an anesthesia critical care physician, and I've seen kids die from flu, and it scares me. Flu definitely scares me worse than COVID scares me at this point. Another website that is good and this one may be a little above but it is pubmed.gov so this is where all of the peer-reviewed journals are so just so that everybody knows i actually am a peer reviewer for journals so i look at journals i look at abstracts in fact i'm supposed to be looking at abstracts right now for an upcoming scientific need i am the peer reviewer i am the critical reviewer so when i review these studies I find that some of them are really good studies and some of them are really terrible studies and I would have sent it back and said make some corrections to this. So we've got a lot of data out there. If you look at the data, the data says we don't have any peer reviewed data to support masking of children. Universal masking in children has not been looked at. Quarantining of healthy children has also not been looked at. We do not know if these are effective at all but we're requesting that to be done. And I have called the Department of Health, I've called Ohio Department of Health, Green County Public Health Department, and they keep referring me back to CDC. And unfortunately, CDC doesn't have any sort of guideline on this. They have nothing that they are referring back to to say, let's quarantine a healthy child. Let's go ahead and mask all of these children. There's absolutely no data to support this. There's no data that goes against it either. We just don't have any data for this. So it's something that needs to be looked at. And I would encourage that you know we send out surveys or send something out to these parents that have children that have had COVID and see you know what were the sequela from this. You know, we've got a lot of unknowns when it comes to this. We don't know what the sequela of the masking is gonna be. We don't know what's gonna happen with vaccines in 10 years. And I will say, I, I got the vaccine. But I don't know what's going to happen to me in 10 years. It was a risk that I was willing to take. It's maybe not a risk I'm willing to take for my kids. Everything's going to be different. You have to look at the data yourself, and you really have to decide what's best. And that's why I think it is what's best for the children is to have their parents look at these and really decide for them versus having these decisions be made when they're really not informed decisions. So thank you. Coming in toward the, toward the end of our list, Brian, Hugh, or Hoff, can you help me with that pronunciation? Hoff, Hoff, okay. I'll, I'll try to keep this quick and not be some of the things that work so we don't know anything. So anyway, I um, wanted to say uh, thanks to all you guys. I you know most of you, I think everybody, but Kevin, um, and you did respond to my email, so I'd like to thank you in person for that. So um, I'm a father to three children in the district. I'm a mid-level anesthesia provider in the community. I've been one of those for 10 years. Um, so, you know, in the beginning of July, this was looking great. We had about 200 inpatients in the state of Ohio. And I sent my kid to scout camp. He was vaccinated. I sent him my mask. I shared a time with a kid that wasn't vaccinated. I had no worries. Okay? I quit wearing a mask in public. I thought this was... 
then don't again. Okay. So there I follow a few metrics that are relevant to me. Um, the first number is the uh, number of inpatient COVID cases that are across the state. And you can find that on that COVID dashboard that a lot of people have referred to. Um, July 9th, that was about 200. That was really good. Um, today it's 20, or, sorry, 2,114. So it increased over 1,000% in just six and a half weeks. That's pretty incredible. To see that. And the percentage of those patients in the ICUs, I've been following this metric for a long time, tended to be around 20 to 25%. It's closer to 30, 29, 30%. So this is definitely a more severe version of COVID. Now, you might ask why is that relevant? See, hospitals are supposed to be around 75, 85% full of the efficient to make money to be able to pay the workers, pay the electricity, pay the bills. And when hospitals fall into a crisis, when you have about 20 to 25% COVID patients, now we're not there yet, but don't think it can't happen here. It's already happened in places like Alabama. Earlier it happened in Arizona, it's happened in California, it's happened in Florida. Okay, So we're not out of the woods with this. We, we want to prevent that. So in my opinion, I think that the schools do have a role in preventing community spread. Like these kids take this virus home, they give it to their extended family. Some of them have grandparents as caregivers. Um, they want to see these people. They want to be in their lives. They don't want to be in fear of spreading the virus. So there's an African proverb that you've seen beat around. It takes a village to raise a child. And some people might know about that. But it's actually true. You know, I don't want to offend anybody here, but we don't really raise our children by ourselves. They're part of the community. They, they have clergy. They have scout leaders. They have teachers. They have friends and extended family. Those people all play a role in raising these children. And COVID is very disruptive to that. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the nuclear family, it is definitely the most important unit. But this is also disruptive when we have things like quarantines, parents miss work, uh, kids miss activities. And the way to avoid that is the universal mask mandate. I mean, I am not an infectious disease expert. I don't think, but the recommendations are there. The only reason they aren't mandates is because those authorities don't have the power to mandate. You guys all know that. If they could mandate this stuff, it would have been mandated. Okay? So I'm asking you guys to just follow the science, follow the facts, and you'll try. Thank you, sir. One more thing. Okay. A lot of people talk about freedom. Okay? I've served in the Army for 26 years out of high school, and I know something about the love of freedom. Okay? We hear buzzwords such as medical freedom, parental freedom. The truth is, the moment you walk out your door, there are limitations to your behavior in every one of us. Why? Because certain behaviors pose an unreasonable risk to other people. Who would go to a firing range where there weren't any ceasefires or safe rules? It would be a safe place. When you follow those rules, you take something to be very dangerous to make it safe and enjoyable. Okay? You can't drive 100 miles an hour down Franklin Street in Millbrook that poses an unreasonable risk of other people. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. All right, our last speaker of the evening is Anthony Lightheart. Uh, Lightheart, is that pronounced? Okay, thank you. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen of the school board and of the community, this has been a uh, very uh, interesting night for everyone. I was just at the volleyball game and I was walking by and I saw the charts up here, so I decided to stop by. So I <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too terrible a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here late, so uh, that's okay. But uh, I'm an Air Force officer of uh, 26 years and uh, I have a strong science background, as many Air Force officers do. Uh, just today, I got back from Hawaii. I've been out in Hawaii for, for almost a month. Um, so Hawaii has been under the mask mandate for nearly 500 days now, practically since day one. They've had strict measures out there. You can't walk into any of the stores or any of the restaurants. Well, I, you know, I think school has been mostly closed down out there. But um, And they're... Uh, Virus transmission rate is the highest it's been since day one. They are at the highest point now, even though they've been masking the entire time. Um, I, I think there's 
the doctor was up here earlier and saying that there wasn't that many studies, there wasn't studies to prove that masks do anything. And I agree with that. There, there's no evidence really showing that they really do much of anything. Uh, and there, there is evidence that they're, they're harmful. When you think about a child's mask, not to be gross, but you think about a child's mask, they have nasal drippings in there, they have snot in there, they have saliva in there. It's a breeding ground for bacteria. It's a paradise for fungus and bacteria. And those kids are wearing that mask all day long and probably not washing it in between wearings. I agree there's some value to an N95 mask, but that's not what our children are wearing. And that's not what we want them to be wearing because that causes a whole bunch of other problems. Or if they don't get enough oxygen, they're going to build up too much CO2, etc. So there is some value in the M95 masks, but we don't want our, our children wearing those masks. But I think there is harm in those cloth masks and those paper masks. And if we teach them critical thinking skills about how small those viruses are and how there's no way a, a virus can not be prevented from going with the airflow and, and, and transmitting, uh, we can we can think about that. We, great learning opportunity if they would examine that. I think the kids would probably come up with some solutions better than we can. I mean, they're the ones that have to deal with it every day. And they, they're smart. They, they can understand these things. They, they, they have fresh minds. And I think maybe it's, maybe we can try to use them to come up with some solutions. Um, so I think that uh, with the mask mandate, I think if you, if you really feel like you need to do it, do it with the older kids, the younger kids, it's going to be incredibly harmful. I heard that mentioned up here earlier. Um, I, I think uh, maybe there's some value in that, but I think more so, I think they need to think about the process of why they're wearing the mask, what, what it can do for them, and, and, and how it can harm them, because there's certainly some harm. I think we know that for sure that uh, the, the, the mask would do. In short, I don't think the masks work at all. Um, the paper ones and the cloth ones, and I, I do think they're really harmful. Um, so, with that being said, I think it's something to think about uh, as a community. And and let's face the facts: this is a virus. Everybody's going to get it. Probably everybody has been exposed to it already. Doesn't mean you've gotten sick. You could get sick later when your immune system's weaker. The best thing to do is keep your immune system strong keep yourself healthy. And I think pointing that is a lot of fresh air and a lot of good oxygen levels and positive uh, experiences and exercises and, and we're in better shape. And that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. I'm a medical oh, laboratory yes. I'm sorry. I'm, it's, fine. it's fine. I'm a laboratory scientist. I work in one of the network hospitals around here. I'm a laboratory scientist and I work at one of the network hospitals around here. Um, we just got mandated to get the vaccine um, and they changed their policy based on antibody testing. Um, I had not been tested, I had not been sick, and I decided to go to Kroger and do the $26 test with a little finger prick, um, and I came up positive for antibodies. I worked in the hospital the whole pandemic. I have never once, like I said, been sick. Um, so I had my kids tested. They were positive as well. Never sick. So I'm wondering why um, you had it up on the board. It's greater than nine, or 90 days is the, um, because it lasts longer than 90 days. Natural immunity has been shown to last up to 10 months, if, you know, and they're doing more studies now every day. So, I mean, is that something that we can possibly look at to have these kids get antigen or antibody tested um, to make sure that they don't have to get quarantined? Because this is ridiculous. These kids are missing school. They're missing out on sporting events and all kinds of things, which is detrimental to their their livelihoods. I think. You know what I mean? And another thing, um, everybody touched this podium. Everybody touched it, and then they touched their face, and then they touched their masks, 
and some people put their masks on here. So my question is, why do we not have more hand sanitizer at the front door when we walk in? That hand sanitizer machine didn't work when I put my hand under it. So hand washing is key. If you're not washing your hands frequently throughout the day, that is how you transmit viruses and sickness. It's, a uni it's called universal precautions. We use it in the hospital all the time. You walk into a patient's room, you wash your hands. You walk out, you wash your hands. You put on gloves, take them off, wash your hands. So that's something that needs to be done around here. I have a friend, she's the principal of a school in Virginia. Every kid that walks in that door has to use hand sanitizer. They walk into the lunchroom, they have to hand sanitize. So why are we not using that, that thousands of dollars that we just paid for in taxes to help fund the school to do that? Buy more supplies to help hand wash these with these kids. And how about that filtration system that the gentleman said? They have filtration systems that can kill COVID. And that would help every school in this district. So again, I'm just a little laboratory scientist with 25 years of experience. Um, hand washing is key. Thank you very much. All right, and again, my apologies for skipping you. Know, I, uh, I really didn't mean to. I, it, it's been a long night. Let me just use you know, that as my, as my story, and I'm sticking with it. All right, we have finished our open communication period, and it is 10.55, so I'm going to have us move on to new business. I might be leaving. You might want to stay because there's going to still be some open closing comment discussions after this vote. So it might be worth your while to stay. So we're going on with uh, new business, um, which is going to be items A and B on the agenda, as well as the uh, hand carry additions. Um, and, uh, Josh, do you have the hand carries available? Okay. Dr. Koza, would you please speak to the hand carry? Items? Yep, so add of 785, recommend acceptance of verbal resignation from teacher Emily Murphy, effective 825-2021, and then 7B, recommend approval of the following support staff of one-year employment contracts, effective for the 21-22 school year, Kimberly Flynn, bus driver, Class 5, step 0, 189, five hours a day, and then recommend approval for the following substitute support driver, support staff for the first semester for the 21-22 school year, Johnny Holiday, bus driver, transportation assistant. Recommend acceptance of the following support staff resignations, Debbie Warwick, special needs assistant, and then Michelle Main, transportation secretary, effective end of day, September 10th, 2021. All right, thank you, sir. Board members, do you have uh, any item in our consent agenda, which is, includes uh, new business A and B, like certified licensed staff employment and support staff employment? Uh, any items that you want me to pull out to discuss separately? All right, then do we have a motion to approve consent agenda items Seven A and seven B. This is Dorn. This is Slotman. Any questions or comments on the consent agenda items? All right, Dr. Kuzak, would you please call the roll? Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mrs. Dorn. Yes. Mr. Kinsey. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slotman. Motion passes. Going on then to items of information and comments. Uh, number one, we have the naming of the OSBA Capital Conference alternate delegate and student, uh, student achievement that will be is on. These, um, these roles were both um, uh, Karen Long's before uh, she resigned. So the, uh, the uh, Capital Conference alternate delegate is for the uh, annual OSBA conference uh, in November. 
and it is after the election, and then student achievement is a throughout the year role. The alternate delegate uh, serves in case the primary delegate cannot, and I'm the primary delegate, and I'm planning to go. Um, so that if someone wants to, is there someone or some ones who are interested in either of those roles, the alternate delegate or the student achievement liaison? For the alternate delegate, is it necessary that we do that tonight? If, uh, if um, in that we would want to send someone, since the other four of us. That's right. I'm, I'm not going to guarantee to be. We'll still be on the board in November, but I think it would be a shame to send someone who was excluded from the board in November. Yeah, I agree. Um, we could we can modify it that um, we the November meeting. We could. The but we need, conference is after the November meeting. Well, we could um, we could actually do it at the conference. Yeah. Um, if, we can we can substitute somebody out. Yeah. But we do need to send them a name now. So we can't table it. We can't table it. We can we can change our minds. Oh, okay. But we can't. So we need to yeah. need to identify a person. And that's true of all, all the OSPA positions. The person can change their mind during the year. The delegate would only need to attend if you can't make it. Is that accurate? Yes. And my intention, my full intention is to attend. Then, then I will volunteer in okay. that you intend to that you intend to attend and we can change our mind. That's right. <laughs> so Audra right. is willing to do that. Student achievement. Uh, student achievement liaison um, helps, uh, well, actually works with our um, gifted in curriculum to identify um, noteworthy uh, activities that are happening and share those with other members of the uh, OSBA. So it's, it's, it's kind of a fun role to, to have. And usually the activity starts at the beginning of the school year, although it could start in the summertime and go through the end of the year. So. So do you, do you need somebody for that position? I, also, yeah, I, uh, I, I would enjoy putting my name forward for that. Okay. Right. So um, then I'll make a motion. Uh, I would move that we would not be given up for each year. Uh, to fill the vacant OSBA roles for our district at the Capital Conference and for the OSBA, so that the Capital Conference alternate delegate would be Audrey Dorn and student achievement would be Michael Kinsey. So I'm making that motion. Is there a second? Second. Mrs. Slotman, any discussion on that? All right, Dr. Kozik, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Laughlin? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Motion passes. All right, um, the executive session for the purpose of considering compensation of a licensed public employee is something that we can table until our next next board meeting, which is in two weeks, uh, rather than, you know, break curfew. <laughs> so I think that, um, I think it would be wise for us to delay that one until our next board meeting in, uh, in two weeks. All right, um, there was two, two other brief items uh, on the items of information and discussion, and that is uh, daily report of the cases of infection and quarantine. That was something that was mentioned and asked for, the board member asked for discussion. We 
We've heard a lot from the community tonight. That's what they want. I guess it's not representative, but there were some people that were pretty vocal tonight. They want to have you know, some measure other than, and I think it was well said by uh, Mark Kipling that his kids will never show up on the, on the uh, you know in the, on the county and state numbers until they're back in school. And I know we are reporting at least right now once a week. I think we're actually planning to go twice a week, but that's still lagging. And again, the school nurses know. They either don't know or they know. And so if they know, they can report it. And if they haven't heard anything, they can let them to report. I don't think we need to wait two or three days or whatever. I, I see no reason to not report that, what we know, daily. I don't know, 8 o'clock at night? I don't know. I pick a number. But uh, Dr. Cozette, I think, works 24 7, so it shouldn't be a problem for him to update it at uh, 11 59 or whatever day. Whatever it is, but, uh, I, uh, I just I just can't see why that's not useful, beneficial, comforting, whatever word you want to use with it. Uh, and uh, so, you know, turn it over to y'all for further discussion. If the if the if the board wishes me to do that, I can definitely do that. I you know if it's for example you know Mondays, for example Monday, I could have that by the end of the day Tuesday that way. You know, it's, it's it's the next day, just so that because again, some things lag a little bit and so forth. So it would be the next, it would be the next day. By but the if it doesn't day. lag, then it doesn't lag. So if you know it on Monday, tell us on Monday. Is it easier to say that it's not easier to report on positive cases daily, but the quarantines are what would lag? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So the that quarantines. That, daily, yeah. The subject to quarantine are, are the ones that are the that, that can be the moving pieces to the yeah. the, the positives are the positives. Exactly. That's really what I was asking for. It wasn't. Can we clear. update the positives daily and the quarantines as we help? Sure. It, we we can we can do that. It just is. There's going to be people out there tracking things, and so when something changes, they'll say, "Well, why did that change? It was 42 yesterday. Now it's 41. Well, it's because things were looked into, and that person was wearing a mask or X, Y, or Z." So I don't have an issue with that if that's what we want to do, and we'll do the best we can to get the most updated numbers we can. So we can do that. I can. Yep, yeah, I can do it. Okay. Well, while we're on the subject, I, I want to say thank you. As you mentioned earlier, I know that there's been extra demands put on staff in the districts when yes. information been requested. I've requested information myself. I want to say thank you. Uh, I've never been heard no. I've never been turned down. Um, along with that, so can, is it possible, can we also report at the same time the number of students who have been quarantined, who have had a positive test result? I know we're getting that number anyway, which I appreciate. Number of students that have been quarantined, they get a positive result if that's what the board wishes me to do. Again, that's going to lag a little bit sometimes. For example, you know, there's a student that's in quarantine, they get that test on day five. So it's going to be lagging a little bit. We're going to add another piece, but we can, if that's what the board wishes me to do, I can do that. I like the idea of all data being available, but I welcome any other comments. We also want well, to be sensitive to the amount of work effort that might go into reporting as compared to some of our um, education work. So we're not we're not over. What's that? Since, oh. Yeah, I know what's that. So that's we want to we want to be fulfilling our mission as well. So. Let, let us know if some things can't really uh, keep going at, a, at that kind of a request. So the number of positive cases from quarantine, from the students that are quarantined. Yes. And, yeah. and, and let me know if that's a big ask. I, I know we're already doing that number, so hopefully that's not any extra work. Mike, it's is just that, announcing it. that cumulative number good enough? Just like over time? Sure. Do you don't need it like I don't need it. Like how many of those happened this week? No. I, I, I Over think time, two, two trying to get at how many kids were quarantined that the word unnecessarily it will be very charged, but I, I think you know what I'm getting at. We're quarantined and we're not. Um, 
students that are subject to quarantine that, that, that become positive during quarantine. I hear that. So by noon, by the next day, is that sufficient? Absolutely. Best effort, noon. Okay. End of day, the next day is yeah. In the next day for what? For the quarantines or for the positives or are we talking about which is it? For the positives. Report on yesterday, basically. Right. So there's a one day lag. I think that's a reasonable I think that's a reasonable So Friday we get on Monday. Monday we get on Tuesday, etc. Yep. Okay. So all numbers by the end of the day. End of the work day. And then next week. End of the next birthday, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. And final, just final discussion item was to in, invite a discussion with the Green County Public Health or a representative to talk through quarantining process. I'd like to you know, comment a little bit more on that. The beat this worth, of course, you know, the total death here. Um, there, there is, without question significant uncertainty of clarity of, of guidance. Uh, one of our speakers, again, we welcome the fact that anybody would get up and speak. It takes, a, it takes some boldness and uh, planning to get up there. But uh, we have one of our speakers say that unmasked children must quarantine. No. Anything with respect to quarantine is a recommendation from the state or Green County Public Health, which derives it from the state. So I'm a board member, and I don't understand it. And uh, we've had demonstrated tonight that some of our audience doesn't understand it. And so I think we need to have them out here. Uh, again, make it a friendly forum, not going to attack them. We need to hear briefing. They need to hear from that, us respectfully back with questions. Um, but. Yeah, so I think we have to hear from them. And maybe they won't come. Maybe they've got a policy against it. Maybe they'll open Pandora's box. If they come to this district, they've got to go to every other one. They can't meet the evenings. Uh, so there could be a myriad of reasons why this doesn't happen. But I am, I, our, 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 our experts are not communicating effectively, accurately, consistently. Two board members, as allowed, and Dr. Bozet, to ask those questions on our behalf and report back. We can't make them come here. But I assume if we go there, they have to talk to us. Well, hopefully, they're not watching this uh, prime time uh, uh, board meeting and get that idea as, a, as, a, as an excuse to not uh, come see us. But, uh, <laughs> okay, you're not. Uh, and, go ahead. I, I was, and, and to that end, I'm incredibly frustrated, and I'm not frustrated with anybody in this room. I am incredibly frustrated, um, as I think maybe there's something that we can all agree on, is that I feel that the public health agencies in our state, county level, especially at the state level, are shirking a lot of responsibility. Um, some people tonight made some reference to the fact that the governor cannot institute a health order. That's incorrect, as far as I'm aware. Those powers have been limited. Um, the legislature now has the power to overturn one. They must be temporary, but those powers still do exist. Um, I haven't been sleeping well, I think. Um, you all have bear important witness tonight to what our inboxes are like every day. Mm -hmm. um, and they come in at all hours tonight. And uh, out of our inbox. Um, and I was up very early this morning and I decided I uh, wanted to do something. So I wrote a letter and uh, you all spoke and uh, I was going to share the letter I wrote. I intend to send this to Governor DeWine and Dr. Van. I invite any board members to endorse it if you choose. I invite anyone in this room to endorse it if you choose. I'm writing today as an individual member of the Belbrook Sugar Creek Board of Education, but this evening I will be asking my colleagues on the board and members of the Belbrook community in attendance at our board meeting to join me in this sentiment. 
This letter will make its way to your office regardless of their agreement. So an empty signature block below um, will be an indication of their difference with the sentiments expressed. Quite simply, I'm writing to request that you do your job regarding our schools and the COVID mitigation measures that you so emphatically recommend. You are the government body with a staff of full-time medical, mental health, economic, and education experts at your disposal. You are the government body that is receiving data about hospitals, infection rates, and COVID spread in real time. Yes, the legislature has stripped some of your power to issue indefinite health orders, but let's be clear, the power to issue health orders, for example, one that would mitigate man mandate masking in K-12 schools, still remains with your office. You are the government body that has the power to issue health orders should you choose to do so. I want to be very clear here, I am not asking you to issue a K-12 mask mandate. I am also not asking you to ban mask wearing in our schools. I am asking that you discontinue your current methodology of talking out of both sides of your mouth to preserve your political prospects. Refraining to issue a mandate while in the same breath Pressuring lower level government bodies to do what you are unwilling to do demonstrates cowardice and utter lack of leadership is a clear example of passing the buck. If you and your team of experts truly believe that the COVID situation is so dire and universally masking our children during their school day is so necessary to protect them from grave consequences, then do it, period. Make the call face the political backlash while resting comfortably with your conscience. If, however, you believe that individuals should have the power to make informed choices for themselves and their children, then absolutely make that clear. Make all the individual recommendations you want, but make your position apparent that these choices should be left to individuals. Your current practice is blatant indecision while bullying local school boards with your televised speeches and illogical quarantine guidelines is ripping our local communities apart. In every town across Ohio, our city councils and school board meetings are turning into civil wars that are pitting well-intentioned neighbor against well-intentioned neighbor. As a Green County native, I'm sure you're familiar with our district and the amazing families that attend our schools. Tonight at our board meeting, we are scheduled to perform our annual examination of our district's strategic plan. This is an off-cycle meeting that we schedule separately from our, routinely, our routine monthly sessions because it is a task that is, is of utmost importance to our mission, the education of our children. I'm sincerely doubtful that we would have the opportunity to conduct this important business effectively or any other business for that matter because our entire focus has been consumed by disputes and decisions that, rest, that should rest with you and your staff. I implore you on behalf of myself, my family, and the individuals endorsing below to make the difficult call and take a decisive stand. Invite the protesters to Columbus and keep them off the lawns of our elementary schools. Let our schools get back to the work of educating our kids. Regardless of the foreign. Here, here. You can reach out to her afterward. I think I know what you're well, I, Maybe I'll share it because I think I've heard your story anecdotally and I haven't even mentioned but that um, the power to quarantine, I think I referenced it earlier, that the health department is, is asserting anecdotally that they don't have the power to quarantine. They're saying that ODH does. ODH is saying that we do. And of course, we are saying that they do because we are a school and not a medical body. Um, that's a problem. And I think it's a problem. I think we don't care about some universal, like shared understanding or shared common goal. Um, that could be one. And Mrs. Gerbic, I know a little bit about your story. After you contacted the Ohio Department of Health, they said to contact the county of the school. I believe you tried to contact the county, and it was impossible for you to talk to it. You tried to get around the phone system, and you were not able to reach anybody. Let alone get answers to your questions. I mean, we said the ball was in our court. The ball was in our court. Okay. 
Yes. Audra beautifully, wonderfully, eloquently said, far better than I could have said it, and if I had said it, I would have taken another 30 minutes to, to read it off. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone here would like to endorse that, it's going to go to Governor Hawaii tomorrow. The, uh, the day they uh, related to this whole thing, tonight we heard a lot from the community about how are we making decisions, what is our position, what actions are we taking as a board. And so I don't think we answered, well, we couldn't answer the question because we're hearing from 25 people tonight, right? right? But it's a very fair question. So what I would propose is that we would have a special meeting where we have Green County Public Health come out. But in conjunction with that, we have an open discussion among board members back and forth, our feelings with respect and beliefs and positions with respect to uh, masking, uh, quarantining. Because one of the things that really resonated with me tonight and from my own observation through some other circumstances is how many healthy children are we quarantining based upon recommended quarantining protocols? And so, do not want any child to get sick with COVID. My God, you know, I'm not hard hearted about that at all. And I think COVID is a threat, no question. But how much harm are we doing, you know, immeasurable harm to our children by keeping them out of school? And, uh, and, and, and so that's the circumstance we're faced with. So we need to talk about this in public so people know where our positions are and then we vote rather than defer this to the superintendent to take administrative action, it's time for the board to debate and take a position and vote and respond to the community, but at the end of the day, we have to respond on based on what we feel is best for our, our school district. Mm -hmm. So I think we need both Green County Public Health and a public meeting, not so we're deciding mask or no masking, but we're gonna talk about the whole gamut, quarantine, what can we do, HVACs or HIPAA filters or open the windows or whatever. We have to do more than just set here like a bump on a log. So thank you. Thank you. So I will be very brief, but it sounds like this time for closing statement. Uh, about two hours past my bedtime, so I will be brief. Um, I just I want to thank everybody sincerely for coming tonight. Um, it's fantastic to see a room full. That's me. It's fantastic to see a room full of citizens gather together and respectfully discuss a very complex topic. Um, I, I guess if I were to have a, a, a parting word or, or a plea, it's like let's let's just all remember that we're all part of the same small community, mm -hmm. and we should remember that truly not one side has all of the science. Um, we've heard from medical doctors arguing one way, we've heard from medical doctors arguing the other side. Uh, we've heard from educators in our district who have written us arguing one way, and educators who have written us and spoken in person arguing the other way. Um, I would just ask that, you know, before you label the other side as evil, just remember that we're all neighbors and you probably that person you're about to light up on Facebook or whatever, you're probably going to pass in the bread aisle at Dobbs Market tomorrow. <laughs> and your, your kids might be sitting at the same lunch table with Stephen Bell. So um, thank you for your passion. I think passion is great. Passion drives progress. Thank you for that. Please keep the passion coming. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your civility. It, it really means a lot. Thank you. I would, I would echo those comments that um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we won't be viral on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube. Um, and, but also we're remembering that um, we are a community. We're going to be, these are people that we live with uh, and are underground on a regular basis. And it's good to be able to have civil dif discourse that is civil. And I appreciate that very much. Um, with that, I'm going to assume that we're done at 11:23 and move that we adjourn. Is there a second? Before, I'm sorry. Before you, go ahead. Just so I have clear, so I'm going to work with Green County Public Health to try to set up a meeting before September 9th. A special meeting. Is that what you would like for me to do? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Oh, um, I think we're over we're September 9th. Let's do that for September 9th. Okay, I will work with Green, Green County Public Health to see if they can do that. Okay. If they can't do it, then we do it beforehand. So I feel like that meeting might need to be a separate day and perhaps even one of our, uh, like a weekend, like we did with what was that, January, like where we're sitting in a circle, yes, obviously the community can attend and listen because of the rules, mm -hmm. we want that, but where we are sitting in a circle, we are it, we, we communicate better, I would agree. I, I can see yeah. the rest of you. Um, yeah. Do you I can just work with them and see what their availability is. That yeah, might drive what we're... That's what they'll come first. Right. Sure. Okay. Regardless, though, Dr., like you said, I, I don't want to mix it in with the normal board meeting. There's just too much other stuff. And I, I want to focus on this. My opinion, I'm one board member. I want to focus on this, discuss it, hear from Green County Public Health if they come. If not, then we'll talk about our interpretation of quarantine, you know, uh, protocols and whatnot, or guidelines, I should say, actually. And so I, I would really like this to be a separate meeting and preferably before September 9th. Yeah, I don't know the difficulties of scheduling, but if ASAP is possible, I think that would be okay. Okay, I'll work with that. But I also want us to have a little, a little bit of time to digest the, the commentary that we've had here this evening. So, although I, I agree that time is of the essence, I do want, I do want some time for the opportunity to reflect on all of all that we have heard this evening. I think a week's enough. Okay. I think next uh, Wednesday, Thursday will be perfect. Okay. Let's see what we can do. All right. Thank you very much. Was that a first by Mr. Carpenter and a second by Mrs. Slaughter? Was that accurate? Yes. For German. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. Please call the roll. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Slaughter? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes.